Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Pinecker. And before I get to my uh, guest here, who's really an awesome person, I like to refer to him as a brother from another mother. And you're going to find out soon. But this month's book giveaway is a timeline of Joseph Smith's prophecies. His prophecies fulfilled by Brian Stutzman. Brian is currently serving as a bishop at BYU Idaho in Rexburg. And so he's a bishop to primarily students, and he was kind enough to stop in my studios a few weeks ago and present me two copies of this book to give away. So in the description is my email, mormonbookreviews at gmail.com, and put in the subject line, September Book Drawing, and make sure you give me your name and address, and we'll get those books out to you if we draw you from uh, the winners. And folks, I just feel like a real winner having this homie on my program. I am so excited, and I just want to say before, Dr. Ne Nehemiah, but it's pronounced, how do you say it? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Dr. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Works for, I say you call me Nehemiah, Nehemiah, just don't call me Baldy. That's very sensitive. <laughs> okay, so I can't call you Baldy McBaldy then. I, I have to, it has to be Nehemiah. I guess you really, you could if you really wanted to. Yeah, so Nehemiah is the, is the pronunciation I grew up with. Uh, uh, I guess probably, technically, it's Nehemiah. But uh, I only had one person who ever called me that, professor at Hebrew University. Nehemiah is the more common. Nehemia, Nehemia, Nehemiah. Nehemia is just fine. Okay. And and tell me, you were named after your great grandfather who was, tell us a little bit about that. So he was a rabbi who was uh, born in Eastern Europe, and he immigrated to the U.S. in 1923. And I actually found his rec, his um, Ellis Island record, where he entered into the United States. And you know, you had to say who you who was sponsoring you to come over in those days. You, I guess, you couldn't just show up. And the people who were sponsoring him were a synagogue in Chicago, where he eventually went and became the rabbi. So he passed away before I was born, but he was a rabbi eventually on the west side of Chicago. I think originally it was the south side, but there was this like Jewish migration within the city. Um, but the, you know, the most important thing from my perspective is he got out before the Holocaust. Um, and it was kind of funny because uh, if you asked him where he was born, I, you could, I actually looked this up once in the census records. So in one of them, it's, I think it says Russia. Another one, it says Poland. And today we would call the place he was born um, Latvia. Uh, although when he, he lived probably most of his Eastern European life in Lithuania slash Russian Empire, but when he left, it was Poland. And he was a citizen of Poland for, I believe, about two weeks just so he could get a, a Polish passport and immigrate to the United States. So Poland had conquered the place in Lithuania where he lived. So I found his his Polish uh, citizenship application. Um, anyway, yeah. So he, he was a rabbi. I was named after him. Um, I come from a long line of rabbis. And that actually... Um, is, is really part of my story, right? So I was raised in an Orthodox family. My father was a lawyer, but also a rabbi. Rab Orthodox rabbi does, isn't something that actually pays money. So lawyer was his was his, uh, uh, his vocation and rabbi was his, I guess you'd say avocation. Um, so, uh, uh, and I was raised really with, with rabbinical Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, and these ideas from the Talmud I studied studying the Talmud in fourth grade. I started studying the Mishnah in third grade. And I would ask these questions, and I was told, well, you know, um, you, you really don't know enough to question these ancient ideas that your ancestors wrote. You know, your great-grandfather great wrote books, and your great-great-great-grandfather, and all the way back, wrote books. And, and you can't even read those books. And so how can you question them? And so I actually decided that I would have to be able to read those books. And I really made a decision. I was going to know more than they knew, uh, at least about the subject that was important to me, which was the Bible, and uh, eventually got a PhD in biblical studies, uh, uh, which is the end of a very long process. But uh, when I was 20 years old, I moved from Chicago to Israel and, uh, to si and studied at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, did my BA there. In biblical studies and archaeology, um, I decided from archaeology that um, I wanted to be a consumer of archaeology, not a producer. And what I mean by that is archaeology is, um, or at least the archaeology I was engaged in, which was what we would call Israel biblical archaeology. It was digging through old 
garbage. Um, somebody would have a jar and it would fall on the ground and break. And I would come 2,500, 3,000 years later and dig it up. And I spent an entire summer sweeping a floor from the Persian period. And I realized I don't even like to sweep my own floor. Why am I sweeping, sweeping this dead person's floor? I was actually sweeping dirt off a dirt floor to expose <laughs> the floor. And I'm like, this is not what I want to do. So I continued in biblical studies, um, which is really the study of texts is what I realized I really want to do. And, you know, that I, eventually I, I, I got to the point where I could read my ancestors' writings. And um, even way before that, I came to the conclusion that, you know, just because they said something didn't mean I was bound by it. Um, I wanted to look at from an early age, I studied the Bible and, and the Talmud. And I, I came to believe that the Bible is the word of God, meaning the for Jews is the, the Tanakh, for Christians, the Old Testament. And I wanted to study that and understand it and get to the bottom of it. And, and for me, one of the issues was, um, you know, I grew up in an age, I'm probably around the same age as you, I guess, Generation X or so, um, where when you had a photograph in the newspaper, somewhere there was a, a negative. Uh, and I said, I want to find that negative. If there's, There must be a source to everything. So if we're being told, hey, here's the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, what's the source of that? And okay, well, the source of that is manuscripts. Okay, I want to see those manuscripts. Well, you don't need to see the manuscripts. Smarter people than you have studied those manuscripts. No, I need to see them. Oh, uh, yeah. I need no. to see them for myself. Okay, here's some black and white photos. No, I want to see the, the originals. So before we get too deep in the weeds here, yeah. I'm still working on the introduction, but thank you for sharing this because there's I have a million questions I already want to ask you. But sure. I just want to say, yeah. first of all, it's uh, your festival season right now. So I want to say, Chag yeah. Samak. Is that Chag Samak? <laughs> and my neighbor oh, said, yeah. hey, make sure you greet him. And actually, I was just talking to a black uh, megachurch pastor, and he gave me this long greeting. He said, tell him this. And I'm like, well, I can't do any of that. So, But it's just great to be able to have, you know, there's always been this really interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing with evangelical Christianity and mm -hmm. the Jewish people. But be before we get there, and also, folks, just so you know, we're going to be talking about Joseph Smith. We're going to be talking about the Book of Mormon. We're going to be talking about maybe some of the some of the uh, ideas. And, and again, if we don't get to everything today, don't feel bad because we're going to have we're going to have Nehemiah come back on and have these conversations. But we're going to try to do a broad conversation. I want to introduce you, uh, him to my audience, which is a mix of evangelicals, atheists, restorationists, and and so many other people, and also Jews. I have a lot of messianic. Uh, uh, Messianic Christians or Jews, as well as uh, ultra Orthodox Jews who watch the program, mm. and, and and I find it to be just, uh, and I get to hear all these different voices. <clears throat> now, I just have to ask you because you're talking about archaeology in the 1990s, which is fascinating mm. to me because yeah. there was a okay biblical archaeological review magazine. Herschel Shanks wasn't that wasn't he the uh, editor yeah. of that? And he was really really pushing for the Dead Sea Scrolls to be released publicly and kind of butted, mm. butted heads. I remember during during this time, there's like quite quite a bit of controversial stuff going on mm -hmm. maybe just because i have you here maybe talk a little bit about that because of course you're the one who wanted to see the negatives and there's these people these uh gatekeepers yeah. who didn't want people to see the the original documents yeah. maybe talk a little bit about that so i actually um uh many years ago over 20 years ago or so i worked with uh professor emmanuel tov at the hebrew university of jerusalem uh on publishing the dead sea scrolls and um it was uh, something called the dead sea scroll publication project and what had happened is, so the Dead Sea Scrolls were originally discovered in 1947, is the narrative. Um, and they came into, uh, well, eventually, the, the key scrolls come into the hands, uh, some of them come into the hands of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and then other ones come into the hands of, the, of this really cartel of scholars uh, who are working with the cooperation of the Jordan. Danian Antiquities Authority. And here's where things get a bit complicated. So the main scrolls were discovered at Qumran. Qumran is on the shore of the Dead Sea. And it, so we have this area where the scrolls are found. Some of the scrolls are found in an area that between 1948 and 1967 is uh, part of the state of Israel. And some of it is Jordanian, or at the time it was known, trans uh jordan well i guess then it wasn't transjordan because it was on both sides originally it was the kingdom of transjordan and when they conquered the so-called west bank or what jews called judea and samaria uh they um came under they the some of the dead seas scrolls came under their control in fact the majority 
of the Dead Sea Scrolls were under the control of the Jordanians. So when Israel liberated East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and obviously I'm I'm Jewish and also an Israeli citizen, so from my perspective, it's a liberation. Um, when we liberated the West Bank and, and the eastern part of Jerusalem, we then got control of over 90% of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Originally, we had a small number that were purchased by Professor Eliezer Sukanik at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Some of them he bought out of an advertisement in the New York Times, uh, which is like unbelievable. Um, it, it was a famous advertisement that said something like, you know, biblical scrolls from the Holy Land for sale, something like that. And um, and and it was they were purchased by um, Israel or the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, but then most of the scrolls were discovered in Jordanian territory when the Jordanians ruled it. And so when Israel liberated that area, they said, look, we don't want to rock the boat. We just had a major war where we were almost annihilated. So people don't realize this. The Six Day War is presented for those who study who have any. Some people don't know the history at all. Right. But a lot of people hear about the Six Day War and they're like, oh, OK, yeah, Israel had this incredible victory, um, which is true. But what you don't a lot of people don't realize is that Israel dug thousands of graves, assuming that there would be a uh, just like a genocide that we would be wiped out. Um, and, we, and if we survived at all, it would be tens of thousands would be dead. We have a park here in Jerusalem where I'm right now. Uh, not far from here is Independence Park. And that was, they dug thousands of graves there, assuming we would just be massacred. And instead, we had this incredible lightning victory. Nobody even intended to liberate the West Bank. That wasn't the plan. Um, actually, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem is part of the story. So in 1948, when we had the armistice with the Jordanians, that is, it was like a ceasefire, um, there was this enclave surrounded by Jordanian territory, uh, which was called Mount Scopus. And part of the agreement of the ceasefire is that we could go from Israeli territory into this little enclave. We could send people into this Mount Scopus area that they never conquered. And one day they decided to massacre people in this little um, convoy. So in 1967, the objective was to open up a road to Mount Scopus that we would control. That was the entire objective. And we just kept being so successful, we liberated the entire West Bank. Um, so we get these Dead Sea Scrolls in our hands, and that was never the objective. It was never the plan. And we're like, look, we don't want to rock the boat. We're not looking for a war with the entire Islamic world. We've got enough problems. We had a local war between uh, Arab states and, and Israel. Let's not go to war with Indonesia. And so they decided to keep the status quo on all kinds of issues. And one of those was the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls was controlled by this cartel that didn't include any Jews. Frankly, some people involved were anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And so they really didn't want Jews involved in scrolls that were written by Jews 2000, some as old as 2,300 years ago. And in the early 90s, there was a lot of pressure to publish the scrolls. And, and I know I'm rambling a lot of different things here, but the, here at the bottom line, the scrolls were discovered in 1947. By the end of the 50s, all the scrolls had been transcribed. By the end of the but 50s, they already transcribed. By the end of the, maybe even the mid 50s. So, and there were so, and not every single letter, right? But they were transcribed to the point where there was a concordance. Now, I don't know if your audience knows what a concordance is if they're under the age of 30. But when I was a kid, in fact, I have it in the other room here, the one I had when I was a kid. I had this book, it was this thick and had every single word in the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. And you could look up any word. If I wanted to look up the word Messiah, Mashiach, I would look up under the root Mem Shin Chet, and it would list every verse in the Bible that had any word derived from that root. Now I just do it in the computer. It takes seconds. But back then, it was a physical book. That's called a concordance. A lot of your audience might be familiar with the Strong's Concordance, which is the same kind of thing in English. I used Mandelkorn's uh, Hebrew Concordance, Shlomo Mandelkorn. Um, so uh, there was a concordance by the mid to late 50s of every word in the Dead Sea Scrolls, pretty much every word. Maybe some things weren't transcribed. But if you wanted to look up the word Messiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was concordance you could look it up in. But you could only get access to that if you were uh, in this little clique of scholars. So how would you get into the clique of scholars? Well, you had to go and do a PhD at a certain institution. I won't name names, right? But you would have to be a student of a certain scholar who was part of this cartel. And we went through this period where there were some of the top 
uh, scholars of the 20th century who never got access to that concordance and never got to see most of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They would write entire books speculating about what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls and were never given access to the scrolls. Why? Because they were at the wrong institution. If you were a professor of Bible at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, you had no chance of getting access to most of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there are, like I said, entire books, entire linguistic analyses where they have access to like seven scrolls and they have no idea what's in the rest of the scrolls unless like, so what would happen is you would come to do a PhD at one of the institutions and they'd give you a piece like this big and they'd say, okay, your dissertation is to publish what's in this fragment. And maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but not by much, right? Um, and, and look, when you do a PhD, you have to write something original that no one else has written before. Well, that's real easy if no one else has ever seen that scroll. And yes, some people, somebody's seen it, but they've never published on it. They produced the concordance that wasn't published. There were copies of it at elite institutions at these very limited number. In fact, there were a lot of elite institutions that didn't have access to the concordance. Um, and someone realized, hey, if we took that concordance and fed it into a computer, we would have a transcript of every sentence in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they won't give us access. And they would go to these libraries and say, can I see the concordance? And they'd say, no, you're not allowed to see it. Well, what do you mean? And it's interesting. I know you're in the field of Mormon studies, and I know some of the controversy is that there are archives that people don't have access to. I know uh, one of the things, and, and I know very little about Mormonism, but I, I know there's the thing of, of Joseph Smith Jr.'s um, uh, seer stone, the, the brown stone, um, which I find absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about that. But so for years, people are like, oh, yeah, there's a stone. Oh, no, that's a conspiracy theory. There's no stone. Well, yeah, some of the leaders mention it, and the church, even the church sources mention it. Okay, how, where is the stone? And they had it the whole time in their archives, along with the little pouch that it came in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the state of the Dead Sea Scrolls up until around 1992. And then there was this big crisis. I won't go into it. But basically, the state of Israel said, we've allowed the status quo from 1967 until 1992. We're taking this out of the hands of the cartel. And we're going to turn it over to a scholar at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, it was Professor Emmanuel Tov, who I worked for, really towards the end of the project I got involved um, in the late 90s. And, um, and his mandate was to publish all the scrolls by 2002. And he more or less did that. There were like little, you know, remnants that somebody was like, I won't go into details, but basically it was, it was minor things that weren't published. And I get people today who say, there's this conspiracy. They, won't, they don't want us to know what's in the scrolls. No, no, no. That, that's something that may have been true, or you could have argued that before 92. After 90, certainly after 2002, you can't really say that, right? At that point, 99 point something percent of the scrolls were published. If there were pieces that weren't published, it's because they forgot some fragment this big in the bottom of a box. And there were things like that, right? Um, but like it, there were things that were lost, you know, you've hung or tens of thousands of fragments, right? So there were literally things in the bottom of a box somewhere uh, at the Israel Antiquities Authority that somebody, you know, couldn't find and then somebody stumbled upon. And there's probably still things like that, right, that are going to be published. But it's as far as we know, of course, we don't know what we don't know. But as far as we know, it's nothing like, you know, earth shattering. Um, and a lot of the conspiracies that were out there like, well, there are Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about how Jesus didn't exist or Jesus was, you know, X, Y, Z, right? Jesus did exist. The Jews are hiding it. No, no, that you can't say that anymore. Like I said, you could have said that before 92. And certainly out from 2002, you can't say that anymore, right? We know that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls now. There are controversies and debates about what they mean. But there really is nothing hidden that we, we know about. And, and I'm sure there are new things that will be discovered. But... Pretty, everything that we know about, uh, it's not deliberate if there are things that haven't been published. Of course, I could be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. There could be somebody, and look, this, and this sounds like a joke, right? But there was actually somebody involved in the cartel who had some of the stuff in his garage, who had pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls that he had taken home with him, and he died, and it was in his garage. And I mean, I was recently at the Vatican, and in the Vatican Museum, they have pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls. How'd they get those? So some Vatican envoy went to Jordan and was given a piece as a gift. And they took it back to the Vatican and put it in the museum. Okay. So, I mean, look, it's kind of like there, there's antiquities all over the world that didn't come from the country they're supposed to have 
Very so it just reminds me yeah. of images back in the day. You would literally have these guys pouring over the Dead Sea Scrolls and they'd have a cigarette. They'd be smoking. You know, they just, you know, I mean, just it's worse than that. There were pieces. So, so the Israel Antiquities Authority has spent millions of dollars uh, undoing the damage of the de that was done to the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 40s and 50s. There are situations where they had two pieces and they needed to stick them together. And this was just after the end of the British occupation of Israel, or what they called Palestine. Um, and so somebody took a British postage stamp, which wasn't of any value anymore because the British had left, and they licked it, and they put it on the back of these two pieces that it, of, of, of leather from 2,000 years ago, and chemicals in that postage stamp were causing damage to this leather after, you know, which had survived for 2,000 years in a bat-filled cave, but they come along, these scholars who, who were wonderful, brilliant Bible scholars, but were not trained in what's called code ecology, meaning they weren't trained in how to deal with manuscripts, which is a different field. Um, I did my entire master's degree at Hebrew University of Jerusalem in biblical studies without ever, ever having held a Hebrew Bible manuscript in my hands, which is unbelievable. I worked in the Dead Sea Scrolls without ever touching a a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls in my own hands. Now, I dealt with photographs that nobody else had access to. One, now they're online, by the way, all these photographs. Um, I, I spoke to this one scholar who did his PhD in the 80s on a manuscript at the British Library, a very important manuscript of the Bible in Hebrew. We call it Manuscript B. because It's so important it gets a letter. It's, man, it's called the London Manuscript of the Torah or Manuscript B. And he did his entire PhD based on color photos that he bought from another scholar and used to look with a magnifying glass at the photos to try to decipher what was there. So I go to this guy's house about five years ago and I show him that right now, five years ago, there are um, color images online that you can zoom in and see those things. And he started crying. This man in his 80s was crying because he's like, I spent years staring at the photographs with a magnifying glass. And now I can open up 10 megapixel photos, which now it's kind of like low resolution, but five, six years ago, that was a big deal, 10, 10 megapixels. Um, and he could see things that he's guessing what it says, and now he can read them. By the way, I got to examine that manuscript directly myself a few months ago in London at the British Library. So, Yeah, and this is so fascinating to me because there's so many places I want to go here, but it's interesting yeah. to me because I remember it was circa 2001, mm -hmm. and it's uh, the local ward in Griffith, Indiana, uh, right down the road from my house, uh, mm -hmm. Mormon Ward had a was going to do a display of the Dead Sea Scrolls, like a traveling mm -hmm. exhibit of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 2001. Well, this thing called September 11th happened, so it was canceled. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a chance to go see it. But maybe just talk a little bit that there was actually there was some Mormon uh, Latter Day Saint involvement. How much? How much were you aware of that? I think the first Mormon I ever met was uh, Don Perry of Brigham Young University. He came over to. Um, Israel to work on, uh, I want to say it was like 4Q Samuel A or B, it's been over 20 years. And he sat in Emmanuel Toe's office for, it seemed like it was months, I don't know, it might have been three weeks, but it was over 20 years ago. And um, and he, uh, some things I'm not allowed to go into details. Basically, he worked on one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he was in the office where I was working, uh, working on this Dead Sea Scroll. And I remember asking him, and I knew almost nothing about um, Mormonism. Um, this was before South Park, right? Which was honestly my first exposure to probably Mormon history. Um, so I knew like this much about Mormonism. And I said to, to uh, um, Donald Perry, um, I think it's Don W. Perry. Um, and I said, so you really believe that there were these golden plates that you know, don't exist anymore that we don't have. And he's like, well, I mean, do you believe in the Ten Commandments and that was written on tablets of stone? I'm like, yeah, I do. I believe that. And he's like, but we don't have those. I'm like, huh, that's a really good point. Uh, that's a fair point. Um, he was the first Mormon I really probably ever had a conversation with that I know of. So, yeah, they, so Farms was involved. Um, and they were involved in particular in digitizing the scrolls. And I was curious why they would be involved. And my understanding of why they were so involved was that if you could find Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, leather fragments after 2,000 years, maybe you could find some golden plates after 
1600 years or so, right? Meaning it makes the story more plausible from their perspective. Yeah. That, that's think, my understanding of it, right? Uh, yeah. And I also think probably the attractiveness to uh, Latter-day Saints scholars' interest in ancient documents is this idea that there were, within Mormon scriptures, our ideas was that there were main, many plain and precious things that remo were removed from the scriptures okay. by like Catholic yeah. scholars and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I almost think it was like a recovery effort on their part to maybe get mm -hmm. back to the original documents and maybe kind of prove that there were many things removed. Uh, mm -hmm. According to their scriptures, they believed that many things were removed from the Bible and that actually uh, what we find with the Dead Sea Scrolls, it, actually it's a remarkable how similar the Dead Sea Scrolls are to what you our modern uh, the, the, the script Jewish scriptures are that they actually seem right. to uh, the 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 the, uh, to, the transmission uh, seems to show that they 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 were very careful to make sure that uh, things were transmitted properly and correctly and very little was le yeah. left out. Would you agree with that? Well, so so I want to give a little more of my background before I answer that. So okay, I, let's do that. I talked about really two, so I, I wear two hats. That's how I like to say it. Yeah. Um, cover my bald head. One is this the hat of um, a biblical scholar with a PhD in biblical studies uh, from uh, Bar Ilan University in Israel, and the other is a person of faith. Um, and there are things I believe as a person of faith that you ask me, well, how do I prove that? Well, I believe it. I, it's not a matter of proving it. I believe it. Um, and so then I want to make a, a distinction, right? So as a person of faith, I can say that I believe that Moses along with Joshua and maybe some other prophets, wrote the five, wrote the Torah. Um, and th that's as a person of faith. Uh, as the biblical scholar, I take sort of a different approach. And the approach I say is, well, what can I prove? Right? Well, I can't prove Moses wrote it because I don't have a time machine, right? So even in a hypothetical way, how would I prove that he wrote it? Um, so what can I prove? Well, I can prove that these manuscripts were transmitted and they were transmitted with a very high degree of precision, um, almost a fanatical degree of precision, not almost, definitely a fanatical degree of precision, certainly from the middle of the second century CE and apparently from the Dead Sea Scrolls in some circles going back maybe even to the second century BCE. And what do I mean by certain circles? So with some people in, um, there are different types of Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, just, when it can comes I just to say, just stuff. real quick for the sake yeah. of the audience, I want, uh, yeah. C, uh, BCE is before the Common Era, and then CE oh, right. is Common Era. Those are those are the scholarly designations for a, a BCE right. and AD. Just want to put it, that up. It's funny. So in Hebrew, we actually, so it, it's really interesting. So CE and and is, is the Common Era, but let's be honest, it's the Christian Era. Yeah. Right? And 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 I and I talk to Christians who say, well, why are you expunging our history by instead of A.D. Anno Domini, Year of the Lord, you're saying C.E. Christian years. First of all, I didn't make up the terms, right? But the irony is that in Hebrew, scholars don't remove Christianity from these uh, systems. On the contrary, we say Lifnes Filata Nutzlim before the counting of the Christians, and Last Filata Nutzlim of the counting of the Christians, and that's because in Hebrew. We're dealing with lots of different uh, counting systems. And I'll just give you an example. I love Bible manuscripts. So when I was in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2019, I got to examine one of the six key manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible uh, called the Leningrad Codex. Um, the Leningrad Codex is important because modern printings of the Bible in Hebrew done by scholars are usually based on that printing. M many of them are based on that print, uh, based on, sorry, that manuscript. And that's because it's a single manuscript that has the entire Bible in Hebrew from Genesis to the end of the Bible, which is Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Um, you know, Christian uh, Bible order, it's from Genesis to Malachi, and Hebrew is Genesis to Second Chronicles. So, um, so I got to examine the Leningrad Codex, and the Leningrad Codex has multiple dates in it. It says, year such and such of the destruction of the temple. Well, that's easy. We know the temple was destroyed in 70, right? The Second Temple. Hmm. In Jewish sources, it was destroyed in 68. Well, what did they mean? Did they mean 60? And that's not even so straightforward either. There are some Jewish sources that count those years based on the day it was destroyed rather than the beginning of the Hebrew year. So it gets very complicated. So when you say year such and such of the destruction of the temple, I know within two years of what you mean. 
And it also says in the same manuscript, year such and such of the Hijra. Well, what's the Hijra? That's the Muslim counting. Why did they use that? Because it was written in Egypt when Egypt was ruled by Muslims. So if I'm writing in the United States, which is ruled by Christians, I'm going to use the Christian era. If I'm in a Muslim country, I'm going to use a Muslim county, because that's what everybody around me knows and uses. Right? When I go to the court, the government court, they're using that counting system. They also give the year of the counting of contracts, which is a Jewish counting system, sort of. It begins in 312 BCE with the one of Alexander's generals named Seleucus arrived in the city of Babylon as a, as a conqueror in the year 312 BCE. And that's the beginning of the counting of contracts. So in English, they usually call it the Seleucid era. But in Jewish sources, it's called Minyan Hashtavot, counting of contracts. Why? Because when Jews write contacts, contracts and they don't want to use the Christian era, they use this thing or the Muslim era, because we're not Christians or Muslims. So we use the Seleucid era. And then it also has a date according to the creation of the world. When was the world created according to the rabbis? Well, currently we're in the year 5,783. Do I believe the world was created 5,783 years ago? I don't believe that. I believe that, well, there it gets to a whole different discussion, which maybe we'll save for a different time. But that's actually based on the Midrash, which is definitely wrong by hundreds of years at, at a minimum. Okay, yeah, and this uh, is what's so fascinating. And I want to I get back, because you are, tell me yeah. what kind of Jew are you, because you're, okay. you're in a unique uh, brand. And I also want to, we, we, this conversation, we were kind of talking, alluding to the documents from uh, from B, uh, BCE and, and BCE. Oh, BCE and CE, right. right. So before the Common Era and, and during the Common Era, before the Christian Era, right? uh, I don't remember what I was saying about that. But so, so let me talk about what kind of Jew I am. I mentioned yeah. my great-grandfather was a rabbi, my father was a rabbi. Um, and at an early age, I studied the in second grade, I, I started studying the Torah in Hebrew. And then in third grade, the Mishnah, which is the part of the oral law, the writing of the ancient rabbis. Um, it's a bit uh, paradoxical. It's called the oral law, but it was written down. Um, it actually was oral, apparently, until the ninth century. Um, and even though it was it was written, you know, we'll say it was written around the year 200 AD, but it was formulated and codified around the year 200 AD, and then they transmitted it orally. Uh, and it's incredible. They had really an ability to transmit vast quantities of information orally. Um, so, uh, and then there's the um, the Talmud, which is a discussion of discussions about the Mishnah. Those are called the oral law. And, and one of the basic doctrines of rabbinical Judaism and ancient Phariseeism. Um, so the Pharisees is a term you'll see in the New Testament, but you also see it in rabbinical writings in the Talmud. And, and Pharisee, Hushim, meant separated ones. And it really meant separated in the sense that they, um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically they observed certain laws of ritual purity that the average Jew didn't observe, and they saw themselves as more holy as a result. So my ancestors were rabbinical Jews, and before that they were Pharisees. Um, when the temple was destroyed, they were long, no longer called Pharisees because they didn't observe the ritual purity laws anymore, and they did kind of, it's complicated. Um, they did some, and it was a gradual process. Anyway, so at an early age, I'm studying the Torah, and the Lord spoken to Moses saying, and then we get to the prophets, thus saith the Lord. And I'm reading the Mishnah in third grade and fourth grade, the Talmud, and I'm seeing these debates of ancient rabbis. And they're discussing about what the Torah said and what other rabbis said. And, and a lot of times it doesn't fit what they say is it doesn't fit with what it says in the in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. And I said, surely we should follow the word of God in the Bible and not the words of these rabbis. And I was told that's heresy. Apicorsis, we call it in, in, uh, in Hebrew slash Greek. Um, uh, I was told this was a horrible heresy, the heresy of the Karite Jews. And I said, who are these Karite Jews? They sound like they know what they're talking about. And I came to the conclusion that I was a Karite Jew. Karite Jew means a strictly Old Testament Hebrew Bible Jew. The ancient Hebrew word for the Bible is kara or kra in Aramaic. And Kara'i or Kara'i is a Jew who follows the Hebrew Bible and not the oral law, meaning I'll read the Mishnah and the Talmud as historical sources, but I don't consider them to be the word of God. And I want to bring an analogy to Mormonism, of which I know almost nothing, so it could be completely wrong. So I apologize to all the Mormon experts. But, it, but the analogy would be somebody who says, I believe the Book of Mormon is true and it was revealed to the Prophet Joseph Smith. 
but I don't accept any of the other, the revelation of the other uh, prophets of the LDS church. And maybe even I don't accept the revelations of Joseph Smith. And, and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, didn't David Whitmer, Whitmer didn't he uh, say that at one point that when Joseph stopped using the seer stone, he went off the track and you can't trust anything he said after that? I think yeah, it's, that. It's, it's actually the uh, FPT, the fallen, fallen prophet theory. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. so it's the idea that, um, mm-hmm. and actually, I think the church that best uh, exhibits this idea is the Church of Jesus Christ of Bickertonites, who uh, basically all they have is the the Bible, the Book of Mormon. Are they call that because they bicker? <laughs> no, they're named after William Bickerton, who uh, reorganized okay. their church. Now they believe they were founded on April 6, eighteen thirty, uh, but they were re- they actually came out of the ashes of Sidney Rigdon's attempt mm-hmm. to start a church in Pennsylvania. And okay. basically, these are what I refer to as the Pentecostal believers in the Book of Mormon, and mm-hmm. uh, and 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 they're a fascinating church. They're flourishing. They're doing very well. And I'm very good mm-hmm. friends with the president and the president's son and many of their apostles. Mm-hmm. And they just they have basically a similar idea. There, you could almost I call them primitivist Mormons, uh, hmm. but I would say Karaite would be a good one too because basically they're just using the texts, uh, the Bible, right. and the Mormon, and nothing afterwards. Now they do. Well, well, so, so here it's a bit complicated because Karaites accept the entire Hebrew Bible or what Christians call the Old Testament, right? Um, and and the difference here is that a Karaite would say, well, we don't, you know, what, what the oral. So here's the idea of the oral law. Uh, as it's presented in the Talmud and related literature. Um, although it's complicated because if you ask two Jews, you get three different opinions, right? right. Mm-hmm. So it's in the Talmud, everything is debated. But there is a position in the Talmud, which maybe you can call sort of like a fundamentalist approach, okay. which says that everything in the Talmud itself was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. And yeah. you say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. There's opinions in the Talmud that are presented as the words of Rabbi Meir and other words, uh, other things in the Talmud that they say, well, those, that's the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. How can the opinion of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Meir both be the word of God revealed on Mount Sinai, especially when they contradict each other, right? It's not just that they contradict each other. They're presented in the context of a debate, right? There'll be a debate about how to observe certain things in the Torah or things not in the Torah in many cases, and they'll say, Rabbi Akiva says this, and Rabbi Meir disagrees and says something else. And we're told in the Talmud in, that whenever there's a debate like that, both of the words of the living God, and that phrase living God is, is, is uh, there's a theological concept there, that God uh, can reveal himself in this dynamic way, which I think is a concept Joseph Smith Jr. would have liked, um, that, that um, he can say uh, a thing in its opposite, and maybe they apply in different situations or they apply in different eras, right? There's different ways to explain it. Now, later rabbis had a sort of a minimalistic approach to this. And they said, look, when rabbis are arguing, we're not going to convince some people that that's the word of God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. So just the general principles were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, like Maimonides says this. Maimonides says the reason there's debates is because the principles were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the later rabbis weren't um, studious enough or weren't smart enough or, or hadn't studied their earlier rabbis enough, and so they ended up debating because they didn't apply the principles correctly. But in the earlier literature, they make this statement. They say even – so i, I got to tell the story, okay? So he, so here's the story in, in the in the uh, Talmud. Um well, there's a lot of stories in the Talmud that express this really well. But one of them is there's a, and it's actually as far as I know, when I was a kid, I was a big fan of Doctor Who, um, which is about time travel. And as far as I know, and I could, and I would love if somebody would come in the con- comments and correct me, but as far as I know, this is the earliest time travel story in history. So there's a story that Moses is up on Mount Sinai, because it says Moses went up for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, what did he do there? We don't know. Beautiful opportunity to make up a story because we don't know. So in the Talmud, there's a story. Um, and if somebody says to me, well, it's in the Midrash, okay, fine, whatever. It's in the early rabbinic literature, in the literature of what's called the Chazal or the early rabbis, the sages. So there's a story about how Moses is up on Mount Sinai, he sees God, says, tying crowns upon the letters. What are crowns? Uh, it, it, apparently, it's like little seraphs that were on the tops of the letters. Um that's what we think today. But in any event, Moses sees the little crowns being tied upon the letters, being added to the letters, and he says to God, what are these for? 
And then Moses goes forward in time to the academy of Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva is teaching something completely ludicrous and preposterous. Some far-fetched interpretation of the Bible. And Moses is sitting in the back of the academy. And one of the rabbis who's in the front says, Akiva, this is nonsense. Akiva is a rabbi who was martyred by the Romans sometime around the year 135 CE or AD during the Hadrianic persecutions, right? So when is this taking place? Sometime between, I don't know, the late 80s and 135. Um, 138 maybe is when Hadrian died. Uh, so Akiva is, is, is espousing this ridiculous concept. And one of the rabbis says, Akiva, this is nonsense what you're saying. How do you get that from what the Torah says? And Akiva says, it was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. He actually says, Halakha to Moshe Sinai. It was a transmission to Moses on Sinai, which is their way of saying there are certain things, most things that are attributed to Moses are hinted at in the Torah, but there are some things that were transmitted to Moses that aren't even hinted at. I'm not sure that's exactly what he meant. But Moses hears this, and it says, uh, he was satisfied by that answer. Why? And what does the story mean? What the story means is there were things there are things discovered by later rabbis that Moses himself did not know, but they were intended by God. So Moses sees God tying the crowns on the letters, and Moses doesn't know what the significance of the crowns are. But Akiva discovers what they are. And, and it's the rabbi's way of saying, look, we know thing, there are things we're saying that are preposterous. I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, we know there are things that are ludicrous, that if you read the Bible in its context, there's no way anybody would think that. But we have this divine authority to interpret the Bible in that way, and that authority comes from Moses on Sinai. And even things Moses himself didn't know were discovering and revealing. So it's a process of revelation in a sense. Um, now, what's an example of this? It says in the Torah three times, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. And the rabbis say that means you can't eat meat and milk together. Now, obviously, it doesn't say anything about eating meat and milk together. It says, don't boiling a young goat in the milk of its mother. Okay, well, that was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, is, is their claim, right? And, and here's the way they explain it. And it really is a beautiful analogy to Mormonism in some respects. Um, so here's the way they explain the oral law. Um, the route, this, which is the key concept of the ancient Pharisees. And why do I say ancient Pharisees? So there's a famous story in the early rabbinical literature that uh, somebody came, a non-Jew came to um, a rabbi named Shammai, and he said, teach me the written law, but not the oral law. And meaning teach me the five books of Moses and the prophets, Joshua, Judges, but I don't want to hear your oral law. You guys made that up. And Shammai beats him with a stick. Um, he then goes to Hillel, this other rabbi. These are two rabbis around the year 30 BCE. And Hillel says, okay, I'm going to teach it to you. But first I have to teach you the Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabet. And he says to him, Aleph Bet Gimel. Okay. Because the guy is not Jewish. He doesn't know Hebrew. Comes back the next day and he says, Gimel Bet Aleph. And this man says to, to Hillel, yesterday you told me, taught me the order was Aleph Bet Gimel. Now you're saying it's Gimel Bet Aleph. And Hillel says to the man, well, if you're going to rely on me for knowing the Hebrew alphabet, you have to rely on me for the interpretation of everything in the Bible. And here's the way they explain it. You can't understand a single sentence in the Bible without the interpretation that was also revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai and transmitted by the rabbis. And they say it's like if you heard a lecture and you wrote notes. This is what they say. If you, uh, if, if you just read the notes, you wouldn't know what the contents of the lecture are. So you need the interpretation. I was taught this as a child, and I said, that's nonsense. You can tell that to a stupid, excuse me, a stupid Gentile who doesn't know Hebrew, but you can't trick me because I do know Hebrew. And if you say I don't know Hebrew well enough, I'll go get a PhD and we'll see if I, if I know enough, and we'll see if you're making this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And I found out, I came to the conclusion they were just making a lot of it up. Okay. Um, and, and, and all that, so, so this idea of the oral law um, has its roots in the Second Temple period, Actually, it probably has its roots in the first temple period, but that goes into my theory rather than what I can prove from fact. Um, and uh, so it for sure has its roots in the second temple period. Uh, it's obviously in the round in the, in the time when the New Testament was written. Jesus refers to it, 
we could talk about that if you'd like. Um, uh, and at the time, there were Jews who said, we don't believe in this, right? So the famous group from the New Testament is the is the Sadducees, right? But that was just one group in Second Temple period who says, yeah, the Pharisees say all kinds of things that doesn't come from the Bible, that isn't in the written text. We're not bound by that. Um, now, one of the things famously the Sadducees didn't believe was in resurrection of the dead. I do believe in resurrection of the dead because I find okay. in Isaiah 26, 19 and Isaiah 66 and dead, Daniel 12, and we can have that conversation. But if somebody comes to me and says, Nehemiah, it doesn't command us in the Torah to believe in resurrection of the dead. Okay, don't believe in it. That's up to you. Um, so, so this oral law concept, right, which is kind of like the doctrines and covenants of the, um, and it's not, right, because we don't even believe Moses wrote this stuff. We believe it was just attributed to Moses. So in some respect, you could say it's like the Book of Mormon if you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, right? In other words, there's all these things being attributed to Nephi. And, well, there, there's a question, did Nephi exist, right? So, so it's complicated, right? Um, a better analogy would be um, you have things in the Quran, which presumably was written by Muhammad, and then you have things in the Hadith, which are things where maybe 200 years later they were written down that so-and-so said that so-and-so that so-and-so heard from the prophet Muhammad. Well, did Muhammad really say those things? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. They're being attributed to Some of them, Muslims will tell you that he definitely didn't say. They're being falsely attributed to Muhammad. Other things, they'll say, oh yeah, he did that, Sahih. We believe he really, it's truth, he really said that. So in the oral law, you have many things that are attributed to Moses that I don't think he said. And as a Karite, I don't, let me put it this way, as a Karite, I don't believe he said those things. Many rabbinical Jews will say, yeah, he didn't say those things, but the people who had his authority um, derived those things, and it was revealed to them, and they were the ones who were given the authority to derive these principles, even if it wasn't a prophetic revelation, right? There's different approaches today, right? All right, in the Middle Ages as well. Um, so, so the Islamic analogy there is you have a 200-year gap between the Quran and, and when the things were written down, the traditions about what the Quran means. Uh, in Judaism, it wasn't written down. Uh, if you believe that Moses existed, which I do, and that he wrote the Torah or was involved in writing the Torah around the year 1400 BCE, it was, the Mishnah wasn't written down until sometime around eight or 900 CE, right? So that's over 2,000 years later. And if you say, okay, well, the, the Mishnah was codified in 200 AD. Okay, fine. So we're still 1,700 years later, right? That's a long time. So as a Karen Jew, I believe the Hebrew Bible um, is the word of God. Um, as a scholar, I study how that was transmitted over time. And what, what can I prove, right? So I can't prove whether Moses existed or not. I believe that, right? That's a belief. And I make a distinction there. And like I said, I wear two hats. So just real quick, just, just so people yeah. understand, give me the history of what Karaite Jews are. When did this mm -hmm. movement begin? I, I don't I don't know a whole lot about right. it. So maybe just explain so, what, what so, and, so the I mean, word Karaite doesn't really appear until the ninth century. Okay. And and it and it appears in the context, ninth century AD or CE. It appears in the context when you have two factions in Judaism, right? So it doesn't appear in a vacuum. It doesn't say there are the Jews and then there are the Karaites. That's not the context in which it appears. It appears in the context in which you have Talmudim or Talmudists and Karaim or Biblicists. Okay. Karaim is simply Biblicists. And there's a clear distinction in the ninth century between Baalei Mikra. That's another way it's described as the masters of scripture and Baale Kabbalah. Kabbalah today means mysticism. It didn't mean that back then. It meant the tradition of the oral law. Okay. So you have oral law believers and biblicists who only believe in the Bible, not the oral law. That's the first time in which we hear about this distinction um, in those terms. Now, in earlier periods, we hear about all kinds of different Jewish groups who believed all kinds of different things. Right? You have the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have the Sadducees who believed only in the written scriptures, uh, but didn't believe in resurrection of the dead. You, dead. you have the Pharisees who believed in a, in, and they actually use the term. They say there are two Torahs, the Pharisees say, written Torah and the oral Torah. Um, and the Pharisees only believe in the written Torah, but then they have this book called the Book of Decrees, which we know almost nothing about. And then you have what are called the multitudes, or in Hebrew, Am Ha'aretz. And the Am Ha'aretz, according to Josephus, they aren't Pharisees, but they are very impressed by the Pharisees. 
they're not Sadducees who they kind of despise. And the Essenes, they probably don't know much about. Um, they have some respect for them. They think some of them are prophets. So the vast majority of Jews were these Am Ha'aretz, these uh, multitudes, who didn't belong to any of those Jewish factions. Um, they believed all kinds of things and did all kinds of things. Some of them were deeply enmeshed in, in you know, superstitions. Um, I guess if you don't believe in... I guess if you're coming from an atheist perspective, you could say all of Judaism is a superstition, but that's certainly what the Romans believed. Um, but I'm, of course, giving a Judeo-centric view of this, right? Um, so, uh, so, so the point is that the phrase Kerai only comes from the 9th century AD, but it's a concept that we believe goes back to the time of Moses. Like if you ask Moses, do you believe, are you a Kerai or a Talmudist? He'd say, what's the Talmud? Okay, so I'm, I'm really in... curious because this kind yeah. of resonates for me as somebody coming from the Protestant Reformed tradition. Mm. It's almost like you have within one of the key things about Protestantism is sola scriptura. It's almost mm -hmm. like we want to uh, separate ourselves from all these Catholic traditions and all this oral traditions, mm. if you will, and all these things and just right. go back to the scriptures. Would you say it's almost a type of Protestantism, uh, sola scriptura movement that's happening and that you can almost make that yes. analogy? Not, not only can you make that analogy, but the early Protestants, if you look in their literature, they describe them, they describe the difference between the Catholics and the Protestants that both sides describe it. I mean, the Catholics also use this terminology where they say, oh, those Catholics are Karaites and they're Sadducees, right? They reject the tradition of the elders, right? And then and then you have the, the Protestants saying, we're Karaites, we're Bibli Biblicists, and you Catholics are following these Pharisee man-made traditions. So you actually have that terminology used in the early Reformation in, I believe, in the 16th century. And then you have some really interesting little things in history where you have Protestants who then write letters to Karaites and say, well, tell us what you... You know, we know what Karaites are in uh, history according to the rabbinical writings that we've read, right? In other words, imagine if the only thing you knew about Protestants is, is what you read in the encyclicals of the Catholic Church. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. You might have a distorted view of Protestantism. And a lot of what they knew about Karaites came from the literature of the rabbis or rabbinites, that is, followers of the Talmud, the heirs to the early Pharisee movement. Um and now, are Karaites heirs to the Sadducees? Not directly. I don't think anybody believes that seriously today, right? Meaning it wasn't that there was a Sadducee who had children who later called themselves Karaites. It was that you had Jews um, in, the, in the 8th century and 9th century who said, wait, why are we obeying the rabbis and the Talmud? Shouldn't we just follow the Bible? My ancestors just followed the Bible. Now, did his ancestors really just follow the Bible? Hmm. Yeah, not really. And, and, and I could give you examples of where there were things in in the 8th, and and by the way, in the 8th century, we definitely have Karaites, but the term isn't used. Um, it, it's used retrospectively um, in the 9th century and later. Um, so we definitely have um, things in this Karaite movement in the 9th, 8th and 9th century that you're like, wait, how did you get that from the Bible? Come on, that, that doesn't come from the Bible. You guys have some tradition that you're trying to justify from the Bible, just like the rabbis are doing, right? When the rabbis say, don't boil a kid, kid in its mother's milk means don't eat meat, meat and milk together. I don't think for a second that a rabbi sat down and said, hmm, let's come up with a new rule and let's metaphorically interpret or symbolically interpret don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. I don't think that's what happened. I think there were Jews who had this tradition going back to the first temple times. Certainly they had it in second temple times. And then they had to justify it from the Bible for people who are like, well, why should we follow this tradition? Well, our ancestors followed it, but it's not commanded in the Torah. Yeah, not everything was command was written down. Some things were oral. And here it's hinted at in the Torah. How is it hinted at? Well, it says, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. You would never in a million years, and this is an important point we could talk about because you're an evangelical Christian, if I understand, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things in rabbinical Judaism that in a million years you would never come to the conclusion just by reading the scriptures that that's what it means, but we're told by an authoritative tradition that's what it means, right? And so you had people in the 9th century and the 8th century who said, why should we follow these authoritative traditions? We want to return to the Bible. We want to continue what our ancestors did and just follow the Bible. And in some respects, the Karaite movement in the Middle Ages is a response to the dissemination of the Talmudist movement, right? So the Talmud 
So you have the Pharisees in Israel, right? And then you also had Pharisees who weren't necessarily called Pharisees as far as we know in Babylon, in what's today Iraq. And the great academies of rabbinical learning, of Pharisaical learning, were in Babylon. And they survive even after the decline in Israel, especially under the Byzantine rule. There's this major decline of, of the Jewish centers in Israel. Um, they're still around, but they're not as, um, they're kind of persecuted and uh, underground and in hiding. So they continue in Babylon in the fourth and fifth century, and then they get written down in the Talmud. And if you look at all the rabbis in the Talmud, the earliest one we have is is um, is maybe from two the second century BCE, right, 150 BC, something like that. And the latest ones in the Talmud are from around the year 500, right? That's the scope in which they're in, right? And and some of them are in Israel, but the later ones are in Babylon. So what happens is the Muslims come and conquer the almost the entire Jewish world, and the Muslims come along. And I'm really oversimplifying this, but this is this is the big picture. The Muslims say. You know, look, we're gonna we're gonna force everybody to convert to Islam unless there are people of the book. Who are the people of the book? The Jews and the Christians, and then there's you know what we call in Hebrew Nisbachim. There's little appendices, right? Zoroastrians, maybe, maybe not, right? Little other groups that are added on, but basically, people of the book are allowed to continue as non-Muslims. And then the Muslims say, look, we don't really want to rule the Christians. We want them to pay the jizya, the humiliating tax. But we don't want if there's a debate if there's a, if there's a fight between two Christians about when to celebrate Easter we're not going to get involved in that and if there's a fight between two Christians about who owns that piece of land they can work that out amongst themselves and same thing with the Jews so the Muslims gave the Jews and the Christians a fair degree of autonomy in internal matters so if you had a dispute between two Christians you went to a Christian court. If you had a dispute between two Jews, you went to a Jewish court. Now, if there's a dispute between a Muslim and a Jew, that gets complicated. Not really. The Jew loses automatically. He, and I'm oversimplifying it again. But basically, Jews administered Jewish affairs and Christians administered Christian affairs. Well, where was this Islamic empire based? It was based in Baghdad. So you ask the Muslims, okay, who's going to administer the Jewish affairs? From Spain all the way to Afghanistan. I don't know. Who's in charge in Baghdad? So all of a sudden you have these Talmudists who are um, have a lot of influence in Israel, have a lot of influence in, to some extent, in Egypt and, and, um, and Iraq. And all of a sudden they're in charge from Spain to Afghanistan. And you have Jews in some of these places who say, Talmud, we have nothing to do with this. What are you talking about? My ancestors did things differently, and we just, well, why did you do that? Oh, we were just following the Bible. And like I said, were they really just following the Bible? Not necessarily. But that's how they viewed it and the terms in which they uh, expressed it. And once they were expressing that as, as a resistance to the expansion of Talmudic authority under the expansion of the Islamic Caliphate, then they kind of had to put their money where their mouth was and go back to the Bible to some, you know, at least try to go back to the Bible, right? Um, you have similar things in, in Protestantism, I think, where you have people who say sola scriptura. Was Martin Luther really sola scriptura? You probably don't think so, and I don't think so either. Right. Um, I think he took a lot of things from Catholicism that he tried to biblicize, to justify from the Bible. Some things may be a biblical justification, some don't. And if you want to go into that detail, I could give you examples of that from Karite Judaism. But as a Karite Jew, I say, I don't care what people did in the past. I want to follow the Bible to the best of my ability. That's the bottom line. So was there like, um, because of course, between Protestants and Catholics, there was a lot of persecution that went on. Where's, would the, the Talmudic Judaism persecute Karaites? Or, or what? Not only they persecute Karaites, but they bragged about it. There's a rabbi named um, uh, uh, Abraham Ibn Daoud, who's writing in Spain, and he writes a book called The Book of Tradition. And he's trying to prove that the rabbinical Judaism is the true Judaism. He's influenced by the Muslims in a, in, in a, in a sense. And what do I mean by that? So in, in the in the Mishnah, I know everything I give is a long answer. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> so so in, in the Mishnah, there's this passage which says, Moses revealed the Torah on Mount Sinai, meaning the oral Torah, not the, not the five books of Moses. He received, received this entire body of knowledge. And he transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the men of the great assembly. And then the men of the great assembly start having names, right? Like, who are the elders he transmitted it to? Oh, I don't know. We don't know their names, right? We know Joshua. And then you jump forward, Joshua, if you believe the, the biblical account. 
sometime around 1400 BCE. I always think give or take 200 years, because who knows, um, right? I mean, it could have been 1200 BC, whatever. Um, so you jump forward from Joshua to um, people in the third century, really the second century BCE, Yosei ben Yoezer and people like that, right? So what's in the middle? Who knows? Pete, well, we trust them because they're the, the elders and the prophets. Well, which prophets? Was it Jeremiah? Was it, um, you know, Nathan, the prophet? Which ones? We're not told that. So um, in the Islamic world, when they gave a tradition 200 years after Moses, they gave everyone's name going back to the person who heard it from Muhammad. So Abraham comes along, and I want to say it was 12th century, but don't hold me to that. And uh, maybe it was 13th century. And he says, okay, I'm going to give all the names, because otherwise, in our world, in the Islamic world, no one will believe it. So he gives you all the names from Moses down to his day. Yeah. Well, hey, we, and just so you know, as Protestants, we criticize the Catholics because they try to show this unbroken line of popes. Okay. And they like yeah. make up all these names, like the sixth pope is Sixtus. You know, they, they, so we know that they were doing the yeah, exact same thing. Sixtus because he was the sixth pope. Makes sense. Yeah. So they just gave him a number. They didn't even give him a name. Yeah. <laughs> so right. it's obviously for us, we look at it this way. It's like, oh, yeah, they, there's, they're just making this stuff up. Just well, no, but I know thing. Protestants who say, no, no, I was ordained by so and so. Who was ordained by so and so? Who go back in an unbroken chain to Peter? Sure. I, I mean, are, am I wrong with those there are, there are some high, name? absolutely, there are some uh, within the higher church, uh, you know, Anglicanism and all that kind of stuff that would make. Oh, no, I'm, I'm talking about like, um, I don't want to name names, but I'm talking about um, Protestants who, and again, I'm not going to name I, Protestants who, who who come from more of a, and I want to say a Baptist background, but here I might be abusing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's and, landmark and, landmark Baptists. Yeah. Okay. Landmark Baptists. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have met some people in what I'm going to call the sacred name movement, and only because they would use that terminology. Okay. These are people who will say instead of Jehovah or Jehovah, they'll say Yahweh yeah. and Yahshua for Jesus. Um, but you say, know what? I'd also yeah. argue that the, both the landmark Baptists and those people probably wouldn't identify as Protestant. No, definitely not. So. No, no, no. They're, they're, well, I don't want to say definitely not. The people I know wouldn't call themselves Protestant. Um, and they'll say, no, no, our church has always been around. Yeah. And, and I was ordained by so-and-so. And who do you think you are uh, coming up with some interpretation? And they'll say, that's a private interpretation. As opposed to the official interpretation, which has this train, chain of transmission, supposedly, allegedly. It's right. so interesting, when, the, the, the Mormon uh, uh, parallels. Right. But because Joseph Smith would attribute things to Revelation or attribute things to previous prophets who maybe existed, maybe didn't, depending on what you believe. Um, it, in some ways, there's an incredible parallel there with, uh, and we can get to that, to uh, maybe. You, you know, I, one of the reasons I think you invited me on, because I did this series with uh, Dan Vogel. Dan Vogel, yeah. And, and to me, the most amazing concept I've learned from Dan Vogel is this concept of the um, uh, of the pious fraud, right? And, and, and what really resonated with me is the pious fraud concept in rabbinical Judaism, they openly say in the Talmud that if you know something to be true, you can attribute it to a rabbi who didn't say it so that people will accept it from you. Mm -hmm. Whoa. So you're saying I can attribute something to Rabbi Yosei. That's the actual example, I think, um, which Rabbi Yosei didn't say because you know it's true and you know the other guy will accept it if Rabbi Yosei said it. Well, maybe you're doing the same thing with Moses and not maybe I believe you are doing the same thing with Moses, meaning rabbinical Judaism. So, so um, and in a sense... If you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, that's what Joseph Smith is doing with Nephi and and um, and you know other uh, prophets from the. And Book he of also Mormon. even names Old Testament pro prophets that like Zenos and others that are I think Zenos is one of them that he attributes that they quote from from the old country uh, that make their way into the Book of Mormon. So there's even this idea of uh, quoting from prophets that are not known by our tradition. Well, that's possible, tradition. right? I mean, I mean, such a thing is possible. Uh, um, yesterday was um, uh, Yom Kippur where I am and uh, the Day of Atonement and I uh, sat down with my wife and we read from the book of Zechariah chapter 7 and 8 and Zechariah 7 to 8 they go to Zechariah and they ask him should we keep fasting on the days which commemorate the destruction of the temple because they just rebuilt the temple in the second temple period and the response that Z Zechariah gives which he presents as the word of God is that God says well Here's the things I told you to do to the prophets of old that you never did. You should do the, those things. In other words, I never told you to fast in the first place. 
He says, when you fasted, it wasn't, you weren't fasting for me. And when you ate it, you weren't eating for me. Here's what I told you to do. And he quotes a bunch of prophecies that we don't have anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible. So it's very possible there were prophecies that existed in Old Testament times that weren't recorded. Or they were recorded much later by somebody who didn't say them, who's quoting an earlier prophecy. Now, how did Zechariah know it was prophesied to the prophets of old? I guess there's a few possibilities. One is Zechariah could have made it up, which is what some people would say. Other is that God revealed it to him. Third possibility is he opened up a scroll and he read it. Right Now, I believe number two, but that's a belief. I can't prove it. If somebody wants to come along and say, Zechariah just made that up the way that you might say, or I might say, Joseph Smith just made that up. Okay. It comes down to a matter of faith. It really does. Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, one of the things that Dan Vogel says, that's just so profound. And I think you got him to say this, if I'm not mistaken. I think I heard him. No, I heard this in, um, in one of the interviews he did before I interviewed him. And they said, what could get you to believe in the Book of Mormon? He said, well, it, or in the Golden Plates. He said, well, if, if, if Nephi really existed, then the Golden plates, plates could have existed too. Right, so if the Book of Mormon is true history, well, yeah, then it could be that an angel appeared to or a spirit, whatever, to Joseph Smith. But if if it's not true history, well, then no, right? Okay, so, so this, this 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 and again, I love this conversation, by the way. So then I'm thinking, okay, now here you are, you're studying archaeology. Now in Richard Bushman's latest book, The Gold Plates, he says I believe in the plates as being a real thing. Uh, in the same way that Christians believe in the resurrection of Jesus and Jews believe in the Exodus. Okay. Fair enough. And That's, the question uh, I have enough. for you is on yeah. paper, we don't have any historical evidence that any of these events happen just purely from naturalistic arguments, right? That, 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 that we don't have any evidence, but the that opposite. Uh, or it's more than that. From naturalistic arguments, it's impossible that the resurrection of the dead happened and it's impossible that the sea split. The Exodus could have happened, right? But if you believe only in naturalistic explanations, then there couldn't be miracles, right? There could be coincidences, and you might think they're miracles. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, right? If you're going to believe in miracles, then that is not a naturalistic explanation, right? And and does that mean it's impossible? Well, I don't believe it's impossible. I, I believe there's no, let me say as a Jew, there was no reason in the world that a resurrection couldn't have happened because in the Old Testament, it said there were people who were resurrected. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but there's there's a story about uh, the bones of a man fell and touched the dead body of the prophet Elisha and it came back to life. Now, there's no naturalistic explanation for that. I mean, I guess there could be, right? He wasn't really dead. He ate puffer fish and they thought he was dead, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's not what it says, right? It says that he was a re he resurrected and he came back from the dead. So from a naturalistic perspective, that couldn't have happened. Couldn't have happened. Now, this is so fascinating to me is that there's an argument that can be made that the plates could have existed and still be naturalistic because there's a tangibility okay. of the plates because mm -hmm. even Dan Vogel and Richard Bushman would both agree that there are plates. Right. Richard Bushman believes they're of an ancient origin. Can you hold that thought? I'm going to turn the air conditioner on here. Yeah, so, so, I'm turn the air on. On. So, so I'm going to edit gonna... this out, but I'm schwitzing to death here. So yeah, no, it's, Hey, I live in Florida, so I know exactly what that's like. Give so me a second here. More thing, and I'll continue talking because I don't believe in editing. I will oh, do this conversation. Oh, you're so, I'll get some topics. This is great. I love this. So basically, there's this argument that um, that there were plates, right? It's a stronger yep. argument that can be made that in favor of the tangibility and existence of plates than you can make of the resurrection of Jesus or of the splitting of the Red Sea. So, so there's claims being made about the plates that you can actually make a stronger argument in favor of plates than you can yeah. of an, a parting of the Red Sea or the resurrection. You could also make the argument the instruments that were used, the Urim, what would be later called the Urim and Thummim, were actual devices that helped translate this device and now some people believe that the seer stone was the main thing but we also are told about these spectacles these ancient spectacles mm -hmm. that accompany the place could these have come from a lost civilization like atlantis or some lost civilization that maybe existed that had advanced uh, technology mm -hmm. see that's 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 the uh challenge that the plates mm -hmm. in mormonism makes to our faith traditions that I think it's it's it it has to give us pause to consider, right? That, that's kind of me just kind of speculating. But what do you think about? So what I found really interesting when I studied early Mormonism, you know, what I said to Don Perry over twenty years ago is, why would you believe in these gold plates that nobody ever saw? So first of all, I had never heard of the three witnesses or the eight witnesses, 
Yes. And he didn't tell me about it. And do you know why he didn't tell me about it? And I apologize to Don Perry because I don't know why he didn't tell me about it because I can't read his mind. But if I had a guess why he didn't tell me. So the state of Israel made an agreement with the Mormons that they would not proselytize in Israel. Mm-hmm. And it could be that he didn't tell me about the three witnesses or eight witnesses or, or honestly much more impressive than the three or eight witnesses is Emma Smith saying, yeah, I felt the place that I flipped through them, right? Because she's not saying that was, and they were underneath a sheet, right? Or a right. cloth or something, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I don't think she's lying. I think that's probably true. Right. Um, now, what was underneath the cloth, you don't know, neither do I, neither does Don Perry, right? You could say what you believe, right? And it could be that Moses existed and he had a staff, whether that staff turned into a snake or not, or whether it was sleight of hand, because with the Egyptians, I believe it was sleight of hand. They had staffs that looked like they turned into snakes. So was it really a miracle or was it sleight of hand? That's a matter of faith. And yeah. even at the time, if you believe it happened, which I do, it was a matter of faith. right? And it isn't until the fourth plague, if you believe, again, what's in the Torah, which I do in the, the book of Exodus, it's in the fourth plague, the plague of Kinim, the plague of lice, where the Egyptian um, uh, uh, um, magicians... They say, it is the finger of God. Right Up until then, the first three plagues, uh, no, sorry, the first two plagues, Dam Saldea, the uh, blood and, um, and, uh, um, and the frogs, they're like, you know, we know how to do that too. Well, not on that scale, but it's, it's not, we're not that impressed. And then when they're suffering under, or maybe it's the boils, where do they say, it's uh So um, here, I'm just going to pull it up on my computer. I'm much smarter when I can quote my computer. <laughs> um, so uh, Exodus 8 5 and the magician said to Pharaoh this is the finger of God and they're talking there about um, what are we looking at here yeah it's the plague of lice so it's the third plague um, so the first two plagues they're like yeah this is these are they're thinking this is done through naturalistic means mm-hmm. and by the third plague they're like ooh we don't know how to do this and it can't be done now you could still come along and say, well, it was naturalistic means. So I agree with you in the sense that, um, well, let's put it this way. There's more evidence, and I suspect I'm going to be quoted by Mormons for saying this, but it's true. There's more evidence that the golden plates, that plates existed. Let's put it that way. Yeah. There's more evidence that plates existed in the time of Joseph Smith than there is for the Exodus. Mm-hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? So I have an ancient book that describes the Exodus, the Torah, and other books in the Hebrew Bible that describe the Exodus. What I don't have is Egyptian sources that describe the Exodus. Now, I have Egyptian sources that I can say, oh, well, they're referring to the Exodus, the expulsion of the Hyksos. Right? That's what Josephus did. He went and he looked at Egyptian sources available to him 2,000 years ago, and he said, oh, yeah, there were these Semites in Egypt, the Hyksos. Well, the Hyksos aren't slaves. The Hyksos are rulers. So that's not the same exact thing. Um, so, yeah, we, so there's good reason to, there's, so what Don Perry didn't tell me is there's good reason, especially to, to me, the testimony of of, um, of Emma Smith in yeah. her book that she describes, uh, I think it's in her book or somewhere she says, uh, was well, mother, uh, is or is his mother, is it Lucy uh, Smith? So uh, Lucy <laughs> was uh, interview, interviewed by her son, Joseph Smith III. And okay. uh, she kind of described the history to him. So that's probably okay. where that attribution is most likely is. You can all correct. So me. where does it talk about where she says she flipped her fingers through the, or flipped yeah, the she pages? Could, she, could hear, she could hear the, 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 the rustling. That was his mother. Not, not was, his... And, and it was, she could hear the, yeah. the pages rest, wrestling. But this is the thing. I always tell people, too. I said, you know, I look at it this way, is that the challenge of yeah. the plates, it's, it's, it's really, it is a faith thing. Because I tell people the best way to look at it is either Jesus rose from the grave. Well, there, there's an empty tomb. Either Jesus rose from the grave, or the apostle or the disciple stole the body. The uh, what well, under that frock? Uh, Dan Vogel believes there are plates under that frock, and and Richard Bushman believes that there are plates under that frock. The faith comes in is that either they're a 19th century origin or they're an ancient origin. That's where right. faith that faith comes in to say the empty tomb was the resurrection. Faith comes in that says that these are ancient plates. That to me is, that's that's really, it all boils down to that, doesn't it, in one sense? You know, one of the really interesting pieces of evidence is, um, so I read the entire um, uh, Mormonism unveiled, the annotated version by um, uh, Dan Vogel, um, and I read every one of his footnotes. 
and, and, I, and I don't remember the guy's name, but there's one of the people who knew Joseph Smith. And look, some of the things they're saying in those in the the um, uh, what is this guy's name? Hurlbut. Yeah, uh, Doctor Philistius Phil, Holbert or something. Yeah, Doctor. Well, doc, whatever his name was. Doctor. It was just that was his name. Right, doctor was, was his first name. Doctor. Like, doctor's not my first name. That is a title I was given by Barlon University, or I, that I earned from Barlon University. Um, uh, so, so one of these affidavits um, dis, describes that Joseph Smith found a pile of sand, put it into a cloth, and he presented that as a plate. And I want to bring the analogy in Christianity. And then one in Judaism. So the analogy in Christianity is, according to the Gospel of Matthew, there were people at the time who claimed that the body was stolen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that in the Gospel of Matthew? Right Now, what's interesting is we don't find that in Jewish sources. I don't know of any Jewish source who says the Christians are lying. It's, it's the, the disciples who stole the body. I don't know of any Jewish source that says that. Um, but if you believe the Gospel of Matthew, there were Jews at the time who said that. And this person who's giving the affidavit, which is published in Mormonism Unveiled, is saying a similar thing. There was something in the cloth, and I'm going to say it was, it, was a, it was a fraud, but I can't deny there was something in, underneath the cloth. And in Judaism, Josephus tells the story of this anti-Semite, what today we would call an anti-Semite, named Appion, Actually, it's in against Appian, but I'm not sure the guy who said this was Appian. It was one of these Greeks who said, yeah, the, the, um, the Jews came out of Egypt because they were a bunch of lepers that were, who were sick and diseased, and that's why we, they were driven out of Egypt. And Josephus has to defend the Jews against this. He's like, that's not true. We weren't lepers. Right? In fact, we may have even ruled things. Right? And, and there you could say the Hyksos was Joseph. I don't know. Whatever. I'm not an Egyptologist. Um, so um, I, I did an interview for my podcast. I have a podcast, by the way, called Hebrew Voices. And I interviewed one of the top historians in the world in the Six-Day War. Uh, he's a guy who was a PhD from Princeton University. At the time, he was a member of the Israeli government. And I interviewed him at the Knesset, the Israeli parliament building. Um, and, uh, and he said, you know, in the entire history since 1967, since the Six-Day War, there has been one book written by a Syrian from the country of Syria on the Six Day War, and it was written by a Druze. The Druze are this religion, mm -hmm. um, which isn't Jewish, isn't Christian, isn't Muslim. They say they're the followers of Jethro, the prophet Jethro. Uh, boy, the analogies there to Joseph Smith Jr. are really interesting, because mm -hmm. um, we know, or I shouldn't say we know, we believe Jethro existed, but we don't have anything written by Jethro. Um, but two thousand years later, there's a bunch of people, more than two thousand years later, who say, "Yeah, we're followers of Jethro," and maybe they are. I have no idea. Um, but anyway, there was a Druze who wrote a book about the Six Day War, and he was executed. So, so let's look at the analogy there. Why don't we find any Egyptian sources? Because people in the Middle East don't like to talk about their defeats. Now, let's be honest. That's an excuse. It's an ex it's an explanation, but it's also an excuse. I'd be much more comfortable if we had the Egyptian pharaoh who described how his predecessor drowned in the Red Sea, and the entire Egyptian army was wiped out. I would even be comfortable if he said there were these Jews who we let out of Egypt because we we decided to out of the goodness of our heart, which, which would be a lie, right? Because people definitely lied in the Middle East in the ancient world. They lie in the modern Middle East about history. Um, so um, I'd be much more comfortable if we had the Egyptian pharaoh who said we drove the Jews out of Egypt because they were lepers and that being a lie. We don't even have that, right? Right. So why do I believe that this happened two, uh, three, see, bad at three thousand five hundred years ago, or three thousand four hundred years ago? I can give you a lot of different reasons of why I believe that. Um, some of them are because of personal experiences that I've had, right? And so you could bring me all the arguments in the world. Nehemiah, we excavated thousands of sites in Egypt and Israel and didn't find the document that mentions the Exodus. And I'll say, well, yeah, we do. It's the Bible. Right? Well, outside the Bible, we don't have it. Okay, doesn't bother me. Um, and if a Mormon says, I believe everything that's in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, okay, I can respect that. Right? Where, where I have a problem is where somebody comes along and says, well, we found these uh, bones of Nephilim in this mound in, um, you know, in Tennessee. 
which is something they were doing in the 19th century, right? Yeah. I mean, look, you can look on that line right now and you'll find pictures of Nephilim, right? And they're obviously doctored photos. And I say obviously because I don't believe it, right? Uh, meaning it's back to the, uh, like, there were these giant ancient Nephites and they were, you know, really big people, right? So if you want to make that the basis of your faith, it's kind of an uphill battle. But, um, or you don't convince me, let's put it that way. You, you get less respect for me, let's put it that way. I don't know. Well, and that's actually, you know, because that actually correlates to a story that's part of Mormonism, which is that mm -hmm. Joseph Smith excavated a mound in Illinois and found right. the remains of what was referred to as a white Lamanite named Zelf. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that this, uh, and that he uh, served under a, famous general uh onondagus or something like that who's not mentioned in the book of mormon but then uh it's also apparently this was a giant uh so so you do actually have uh like these claims that are making archaeological claims that are being made by joseph smith himself during the time where he is wandering the plains of the nephites as he referred to them in a letter to uh emma and so he's he's naming us uh locations uh, he's excavating mounds, archaeological digs, uh, finding what he believes are uh, uh, that prove the Book of Mormon. So even Joseph Smith himself was doing this, which I find fascinating. Not only was he, uh, you know, this this scripture revealed to him, but he was an active participant in actually proving it through archaeological and identifying uh, certain things as well. I find that to be interesting. So if the Nephites existed, it's no problem. If the Nephites didn't exist, that's the least of the problems, right? I mean, so you make an interesting point. It's possible the Nephites existed and that they had these prophets for hundreds of years who were predicting the coming of a savior. It's possible there were a bunch of, like, we could, you can explain this naturalistically. It's possible there were a bunch of Native, what we call today Native Americans, who had this um, delusion Right. Like, like, let's 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 approach this from a naturalistic perspective, just as a thought experiment. Um, they had a delusion. And what convinced that they saw Jesus appear to them? Right. And what convinced them that the delusion was real? Well, there had been prophets for hundreds of years who were predicting it. I, I want to give an Old Testament analogy. OK, so we have a book in the Old Testament called the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 28, Jeremiah has this encounter with another prophet whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, and it's a beautiful scene there, um, because the other prophet says in two years, the vessels of the house of God, which had been taken by the Babylonians into Babylonia, um, as war booty, um, he said in two years, those will be returned and the kingdom will be restored. And Jeremiah said, no, we're going to have 70 years of exile. And for 70 years, we're going to go into exile and we will not come back from this exile for 70 years. And um, let's look up the guy's name. So uh, uh, it's a really fascinating story. Um, and here's where, where I think I'll have some disagreement with some Christian doctrines. Um, so it takes place in the beginning of the kingdom of Zedekiah in the fourth year. So let's put that in context, okay? So in 597 BCE, uh, there's an exile in which um, the king of Judah is conquered and taken, um, and a bunch of Jews are taken into exile. And it isn't until 586 BCE, 11 years later, 11 years later, that the big exile happens. Right. So there's 11 years where King Zedekiah is king, um, and, and there are people during that 11 years who think this exile is a temporary thing. Two years from now. We're going to be back and everything's going to be fine. Um, and so here it says, uh, let's see. All right, it's 28 1 of Jeremiah. Um, I'm, I'll read from the King James Version. Uh, I like to read from the Hebrew, but let's read it. And it came to pass the same, in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, which was of Giv'on, of Gibeon. Now, what's Gibeon? Gibeon is where the tabernacle was, according to, according to the book of chronicles um <clears throat> right the tabernacle was in shiloh and then some people say it was destroyed after that but according to chronicles there was a tabernacle at least in gibeon um so this prophet who isn't from the temple in jerusalem he is from the temple in gibeon or some high place in gibeon he spake unto me into that means jeremiah in the house of the lord in the presence of the priests and all the people saying so 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 think of the scene here it's like you have somebody who comes from Rome from the Catholic Church, 
and says, I have a message from the Pope, and he's speaking to the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? And the Archbishop of Canterbury is like, I don't accept the Pope. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, right? And in Hebrew, it's yud heh bav -Hey, the name of God, right? So he's not prophesying in the name of Baal or some other god. He's prophesying in the name of the God of Israel. He says, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years, I will bring again to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from his place and carried them to Babylon, etc. Then the prophet, verse 5, the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hanani in the presence of the priests, Anyway, long story short, there's two prophets who are claiming to speak in the name of Yehovah, the name of the God of Israel, yud -Heh one says it'll be two years that we come back from exile, one says 70 years. And in retrospect, we say, well, of course, Hananiah was the false prophet. But why do we really say that? Because Jeremiah was right. And seven years later, they came back from Babylon. If it had been two years later, we would be saying Hananiah was the true prophet. Now, if you want to explain this from a naturalistic perspective, you could say Jeremiah got lucky. There were thousands of prophets. One of them said two years, one said three years, one said four years, one said, we don't know. It could be, right? And the one who happened to get it right at 70 years, that was the one that we that we included in, in our Bible because he got it right. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Sure, anything's possible, mm -hmm. right? I don't believe that, but that's possible. It is true to some extent, right? One of the takeaways from this story is Jeremiah says, you can believe Hananiah or you can believe me, you won't know who's true, who's telling the truth for 70 years. That's basically what Jeremiah says. He says anybody can make a prophecy. And if it's a prophecy of a good thing happening, that's going to happen. Uh, I won't go into details. Long story short, it wasn't for 70 years that we knew that Jeremiah was a true prophet. We had no way to know, right? In the, to in the Torah, the standard is, does a prophecy come true? So for 70 years, you would have no way to know. So it could be that... Jesus appeared to the Nephites, or there was a bunch of Nephites who had a mass delusion. Okay, what's the analogy? Well, you have the, um, uh, and you're not a Catholic and neither am I, but the Catholics believe that there were these three children at Fatima in Spain who had the Virgin Mary appear to them. There were thousands of people there who didn't see the Virgin Mary, but they saw something strange with the sun. Okay. Do I believe that happened? I believe there were thousands of people there, and I believe the children claimed they spoke to Mary. Actually, it turns out only one of them spoke to Mary, whatever. Somebody claims they spoke to Mary um, who appeared to them. Did that really happen? I don't believe that. But there were people at the time who believed it, and there were people who claimed it. It could be there were Nephites who claimed that this prophet from across the sea or Savior mm -hmm. or whatever appeared to them. And the reason that they believed it was because there have been prophets for hundreds of years who said, this is going to happen. Now, all the prophets who didn't say that, there'd be no reason to believe them. They didn't predict anything that came true, right? Um, right? So, so it's kind of like, um, um, how do I explain this? I know there's a terminology I'm looking for here. Um, you know what the result is, and because of that result, you say, oh, yeah, those are the guys who were telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. Like everybody who who or I don't remember the guy's name, but the guy who said the 2008 crash was going to happen, he turned out to be brilliant. But he could have been wrong. Right. Right. He happened to be right. And everybody else was wrong. But we only know that in retrospect. Now, do I think that Jesus appeared to the Nephites or whoever? Well, no, I don't believe that. But if you want to believe that, it could still be explained naturalistically. Right. Is, is I think what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And, and you could also make the argument for the in the old world. The the the, the post resurrection Christ could have been a delusion as well, you know. So oh, there are people who say that. Yeah, absolutely. There are only people say, or Bar Airman says it was. He says I don't know if it was the uh, the disciples who stole the body. Maybe some random person walked in there and took the body for whatever reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any number. We don't of, know. Uh, we don't know. That's the thing. That's where the whole faith thing comes in. You know what's so fascinating to me is like you know, um, I I've, I've been dealing with lots of different scholars, you know, both faithful and maybe some that are a little bit more, you know, like, you know, and then you have people like Dan Vogel that are more naturalistic, you know, and it's so fascinating because, you know, I've had great conversations with Dan Vogel. Yeah. And I think that his work is really important because this idea of, uh, like you said, like a pious fraud, but we even talk mm -hmm. about just, you know, I, I remember you mentioning um, the idea of even anachronisms 
uh, mm. that you deal with anachronisms in Judaism that are hundreds, if not thousands of years old, and yet we can deal with anachronisms that are just a few years old I mean, within the study of early Mormonism. Yeah. And that was kind of one of the more interesting things that you kind of came across as well. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. When Dan Vogel talks about, let's say, the first vision uh, of, uh, of Joseph Smith Jr., right? Um, he'll say, well, that was an anachronism that what he describes and you know, like, 1835 and 1838 versus what what the reality was in 1820 and, and, and yeah we had talked about this before the the program um that the anachronisms that we deal with is you know in, in let's say old testament studies is you know uh abraham has uh camels and right. while the, we believe the camel wasn't domesticated we meaning archaeologists right. until you know uh, hundreds of years after or maybe a thousand years after, I don't remember the exact number, right? After um, after Abraham, okay. Um, or we, we deal with anachronisms really in terms of, of hundreds and thousands of years rather than in terms of, like, like it never even occurred to me until I heard Dan Vogel say this and I read some of his writings, that you could use the term anachronism about something from 10 or 20 years before. I, I mean, I think of things that happened in my own life decades ago that I haven't written about. And I've never even talked about. And why not? Well, some, some of them, because they're very near and dear to me, and I don't haven't found the right opportunity where I feel it's appropriate to write about or talk about. Uh, I'll give you an example from my own life. And here I'm going to take off the scholar hat and put on the believer hat. Good, good. When I was eight years old, so my father was a rabbi, and we did the very traditional. Right? I said I'm a Karite Jew. I follow just the Old Testament. That's not how I was raised. I was raised as a full-blown modern-day Pharisee. And what I mean by that is not in a negative way. And this blew my mind when I heard Christians use the term Pharisee in a negative sense. Pharisee means somebody who is so holy, he observes ritual observances that even he doesn't think are required, but he's trying to sanctify himself. Because that's what it means, la flish, is to set apart something for holiness. Like you say, la flish maaseh, to set apart the tithe, right? So Pharisee means somebody who is holy, right? That's what it means in Jewish history. So it's not a negative term at all um, in Jewish history. Um, so I grew up with all these traditions. Some of them are later traditions, from, later than the Pharisees, but they were for me traditions, right? So one of the traditions is that, or one of the beliefs is that Elijah never died. And there's a belief that Elijah comes to every home that's observing the Passover Seder, that's the ceremony on the eve of Passover, and you, op and you actually pour a cup of wine for Elijah, called the cup of Elijah, and you open up the door and you let Elijah in. And I remember I'm a kid, I'm something like eight years old, and my family, we're sitting around and we're doing this set, these different ceremonies at the Passover Seder, and we start talking about, oh, Elijah. And we're joking, like, what is Elijah? He's like Santa Claus, he's going from house to house on a sleigh. That you come. How can you go to every house? But it looks so I was came from a very devout family, but there was also this streak of like modern rationalism. Right? My father was a devotee of, of Maimonides. So when I say modern rationalism, that's actually not true. It's medieval rationalism. Um, he believed all kinds of things that nobody today, uh, let's say if you told these to Richard Dawkins or to Dan Vogel, he would say that's not rational at all. But from the medieval perspective, they seem very rational. Um, or they are rationalistic. So my father and, and the whole family is kind of laughing about this, right? Like, oh, you know, <laughs> Elijah's coming to our house. So I'm eight years old, and my father says, okay, Nehemia, you go open the door. So I go, and I open up the door, and standing in front of me, I see Elijah standing. Now, this is interesting, because I've studied now a lot about Mormonism. Do I see him in my mind's eye or with my physical eyes? Mm -hmm. I see him with my physical eyes. Do I see him the way I'm seeing you right now? No. He was sort of this white, translucent figure. So that was when I was eight. I told two people that story over the next 30 years because it wasn't thing I, anything I shared with people. Wow. And why didn't I share it with people? I, what I should have done is at that moment run into the other room and said, oh, let's go the front door. You know what would have happened if I would have done that? I would have been locked away in an insane asylum. Um, so I decided to share this story years later for various reasons of things that other things that happened to me, and I decided it's time to share it. And I shared it in a public forum. 
And a friend of mine who was at the time a Methodist pastor, his name is Keith Johnson, he said, Nehemi, you shared this in public to thousands of people and you never told your family. You need to go tell your family. They shouldn't hear about this in a video on YouTube. I think this was before YouTube when I told them. But anyway, uh, or maybe it was the early days of YouTube. Um, so I go and I, uh, it's a Shabbat evening. I'm at my sister's house in Jerusalem. Uh, she's there with her family and my mother's there. And I say, Mom, I've got something to tell you. And I tell her the story of exactly what happened. And my mother has this grin that forms across her face. And she looks over her shoulder. She says, you don't still see him, do you? And that's why I never told her that I saw Elijah. Now, if a Dan Hoyle comes 100 years from now and says, why didn't Nehemia share that when he was 12? Why didn't he share it when he was 14? Why didn't he share it when he was 18? Why did you wait till he was 38? Because I didn't feel like it was the right time. Do you want to say it was an anachronism that I didn't share it back then, earlier? That doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, there's people who are writing histories now about things that happened in you know, the Korean War. I don't know if there's World War II still, because I don't know if they're that old. But there might be people who a few years ago were writing about their experiences in World War II, and we don't say, well, that was an anachronism. Now, sometimes you might say it's an anachronism, right? And we have examples of that, right? You'll have somebody who tells the story of how they were in the Holocaust, and they were in Treblinka, and that's how they got the number on their arm. And the Holocaust historian says, wait a minute. Nobody got numbers on their arm except at Auschwitz, which as far as I know is, is correct. So why did the guy say he got the number on, you know, I don't know. He made up a story. He wanted to feel like he was involved. He wanted to convey it in a way that people would understand and everybody knows about the numbers, right? Unless you're an historian who studies it and you're like, wait, that didn't happen at Treblinka, right? Um, so, so, so I have a problem saying there's an anachronism when you're writing something, you know, 15 years later or 20 years later, but he could be right, right? It could be that there's an anachronism. It, it, it really challenges me, me to think about things in different ways. So, so that's what I love about the study of early Mormonism. It's really challenged me about some of the things I believe, both as a scholar and a person of faith. And, and I, I'll just give you an example. So the Torah. So one of the classic, so the Torah is called the, the book of the Torah of God, it's called that in the book of Joshua. And then later it's called the book of the Torah of Moses. Well, the last chapter has Moses dying. So did Moses write that part? So there are ancient rabbis who come along and say Moses wrote it in tears because he was writing about his own death. And I believed that as a kid. And it's perfectly plausible. Why not? Why can't Moses write about his own death? But then as an adult, I think about that and I'm like, well, okay, well, what's the other opinion in ancient Judaism? That Joshua wrote it. And why, why did they say Joshua wrote it? Because the last verse ends with Moses dead up on a mountain. So unless he wrote it prophetically as something in the future, and it's presented in past tense, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's past tense, right? You have a thing in, in many languages called prophetic past. Okay. It still makes sense that, that um, Moses didn't write it. And then we have a reference to the city of Dan in the Torah. Well, we know how the city of Dan got its name. And by the way, this isn't me in the 21st century just saying this. There were Jews 800 years ago who said, and they had to say it in a very careful way so they didn't get excommunicated. But they basically said, okay, when it says that um, Abraham chased the, um, these enemies as far as Dan, and the city of Dan is named after one of Abraham's descendants, that and it isn't called that until after the time of Joshua. Well, so Moses didn't write that. Now Moses could have written it prophetically, but people would have said, Dan, where's Dan? That doesn't exist. Well, who's Dan? I'm the tribe of Dan. How is there a city called Dan? And you could say, oh, when the Danites came to Dan, not the Mormon Danites, but the biblical Danites. When the biblical Danites came to the city of Laish, they said, Oh, we read about Abraham chasing people up north. Let's call the city Dan. Right? Of course, it doesn't say that in the book of Joshua or the book of Judges, where it's called Dan, right? So the point is, as an adult, I, I'll take a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A more rationalistic approach and say, okay, so somebody was copying this hundreds of years after Moses, and it said that Abraham chased 
these people as far as Laish, and they know that Laish is now called Dan. So that's one of what, that's very similar to Dan Vogel's anachronisms, right? And there are Jews 800 years ago who say this, and, they, and, they don't, and I shouldn't say they don't have a problem saying it because they say it like in coded language because they're afraid of getting excommunicated. But they're like, let's let's be honest about this among, amongst ourselves. We can't tell this to the to the average person because they've got to believe that Moses wrote every word up on Mount Sinai. But come on, obviously Moses didn't write about chasing the people as far as Dan. Does that so make any sense? It yeah. makes a lot of sense. And my question to you is, how do you approach the Hebrew scriptures then? Because there is this mm -hmm. idea that it's like perfect. It was perfect. And I don't know where you fall. I mean, because obviously you, you you try not to, in the to the best of your ability, you try to just be following the scriptures, the words themselves, mm -hmm. and try to detach the superstitions and the legends and the myths that mm -hmm. have been attached to this to the, these texts. Mm -hmm. How do you approach the Hebrew scriptures and 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 you know, because I kind of look at it like I, I, I look at it this way, you know, and I'm, I'm more I, I kind of did a big like a deconstruction of my scriptures because, of course, I was an atheist for like 12 years. Yeah. And I kind of but I, but I often but I still think in one sense that there was a Moses. There was probably an Abraham. There was I definitely believe there was a Moses and Abraham for sure. Yeah, that there was probably a King David in the same way that I believe that there probably was a King Arthur, that there was probably some. Uh -huh tribal chieftain named arthur and a lot of stories were written about him that became what would be part of the you know the part of the stories of king arthur i kind of approach i i kind of look at it from that approach on one sense like you know this is my deconstructed view of things i do believe mm -hmm. that generally speaking these documents are speaking about real people that's just one thing i'm throwing that and put that to the side but how do you approach mm -hmm. hebrew scriptures uh is it literal uh how literal do you take it and then and then how do you view that's it? an interesting question so um, I'll describe myself as unapologetically a biblical Old Testament fundamentalist. Okay. Um, I believe that God created the world in six 24 hour days. Okay. But if that, but if that was billions of years, it doesn't bother me either. Okay. Cause I don't know. I wasn't there and it really makes no difference to me. Um, when I look at paleontology, it looks like it was billions of years. And it, and to me, the young earth creationist who says, I'm going to explain how there were dinosaurs running around with Adam and Eve that doesn't convince me. You want to tell me about hydrological sorting and the flood? Uh, come on. I, I'm not convinced by that. Um, I, But I don't have a problem saying it was six 24-hour days, but if those 24-hour days were metaphorical, I'm fine with that too, okay. right? I don't know how God did it. I wasn't there. I believe he did it, right? Did he do it through guided you know, evolution? Um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I believe that God created... Adam and Eve, and how he did it, I don't know. I know how he described it, but if you look in the book of, and so I'm one, in one respect, I'm very much a, a literalist, but but literalism isn't really a, uh, the correct term from a Jewish perspective. I want, I want to make that clear. Um, I think that's a very Christian idea. So in Judaism, we have this idea called the pshat. Pshat means the plain meaning. The plain meaning is def defined as any, as any interpretation based on the language and the context using reason. Now, that, now that's, a, that's I just said a lot of stuff, and each word we can we can analyze there. But so so I once gave a lecture to this uh, Jewish synagogue. Um, and it's interesting. There's this Jewish tradition that on the festival of Pentecost, or what we call Shavuot, some Jews stay up all night and they study history and scripture. They call it studying Torah, right? But it's, it's things related to the Torah sometimes. So I gave a lecture at this synagogue and uh, I told them how I speak to a lot of Christian groups, and the Christians tell me that they don't interpret the Bible, they just read it. And from that Jewish congregation, I got literally a roar of laughter. Because to a Jew, that, that's somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Like, from the Jewish perspective, I should say, there's no such thing as reading a text without interpreting it. And uh, the example I like to give is, in Hebrew, it says, thou shalt not kill. Actually, it says, thou shalt not murder. Then we already have an interpretation, right? But the words in Hebrew, thou shalt not murder. So this isn't my uh, explanation. This is uh, There was this woman in the 20th century named Nechama Leibowitz, who was uh, an Israeli scholar. And she really was one of the great Bible uh, commentators of the 20th, 20th century. And she said, when you read the Ten Commandments in Hebrew, lo tzach, you can read it as a commandment, which we all do. But she said, in theory, you could read it as a rhetorical question. Lo tzach? 
Thou shalt not murder? Of course you're going to murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery? Of course you're going to commit adultery. Right? So you can read it actually as a commandment to do the very opposite of what it says. Now, why don't we read it that way? Why do we say that's utterly ridiculous? Because we read it, we interpret it in based on the language and the context using common sense. Now, what part of that is common sense? God's not commanding us to murder. And there's other places where it says, if you murder, you get executed, right? So there's some context, right? But in theory, you could take it literally and still get it wrong, right? Thou shalt not murder, or thou shalt not commit adultery. If you present it as, and it makes more sense in the Hebrew intonation, lo tiltzach, of course you're going to murder. Lo tinach. Now, nobody reads it that way, right? Because we intuitively say, I want to interpret it. What does it mean in its original context? That's what I ask. Look, this is a debate within American law, right? When you read the Constitution, do you read it in the original context? Or do you make it say whatever you want it to say based on your own political agenda? Now, I already expressed my view by, by presenting it that way, right? I'm an originalist when it comes to the Bible. Having said that, I am living in 2023, and I have to ask, how does it apply today? I don't live in an agrarian society, right? So maybe there's a different application in, in a, in a, a, a what do we live in, a post-capitalist society? I don't even know. I'm not an economist. What do we, we live in a 2023 economy, so things will be different, right? There might be something where I read the Torah and I say, here's a principle, and it doesn't apply today the way it applied in 1400 BCE because I just live in a different world. Um, and we can go to some examples of that if you want. So, so in some respect, I'm, I'm a, a biblical literalist, but that's not really a concept in Judaism, right? Meaning in Judaism, we say we want to, we, we have two approaches. We have the pshat and we have the drash. Pshat is the plain meaning. That's what literally what it means. The plain meaning is the interpretation based on the language and the context using reason. And when I interpret scripture, I want to interpret it based on the pshat. Drash says, drash literally means seeking. But what it really means is to say, I'm not bound by the plain meaning. I'm not bound by the context or the language. And I'll give you an example. We, get, we had an example before. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Based on the language and the context, a kid is a young goat in Hebrew, gidi, young goat. And boil, I know what boil means. And I know what uh, milk is. Although that could be interpreted in two ways. So let's not get into that. I know what milk is. So boil, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk means don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. So when a rabbi says, no, it means don't meet, eat meat and milk together, it's not because they're stupid. They know what the pshat is. They say, no, it means this other thing. And you only think it means that because you're missing this piece of information, which is what was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Okay, could I have come to that conclusion myself? No, of course not. Right? And, and you, in a sense, you have a similar thing in the New Testament. So let's talk about that for a minute. And here's where there's this disconnect between Jews and Christians often. The Christian missionary will come to the Jew and say, look, uh, uh, out of Egypt, I called my son, Hosea, uh, was it 11.1? One? Um, or 1.11, I don't know, whatever. Um, out of Egypt, I called my son. Let's look at that. And they'll say, obviously, this is talking, yeah, when Israel was, uh, uh, yeah, it's, and they, um, it is Hosea, uh, and it's quoted in the New Testament as a prophecy about Jesus, right? right? And the Jew looks in the context and says, wait a minute, this is talking about Israel and Egypt. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. That's the King James, and I called my son out of Egypt, right? Okay, so here, here's two possibilities. I guess there's more than two possibilities. Let's, let's, some possibil let's talk about the Gospel of Matthew when it quotes that. Maybe Matthew didn't know what the original context was. He didn't know what it said in Hosea. Maybe he hoped you wouldn't check. Or maybe Matthew was presenting this the way when the rabbis say, don't boil a kid's mother's milk means don't eat meat and milk together. We have this other um, uh, uh, piece of information. And based on this other piece of information, we can apply this prophetically to Jesus. Yes, it meant that in Hosea 11 that it was talking about Israel in Egypt, not about Jesus in Egypt. So what's the, which one does Matthew really mean? 
I think Matthew was interpreting that verse the way that the rabbis are interpreting don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. And why do I say that? Well, because Matthew came from a Jewish context, and that's how Jews read everything. Mm. Right? So you'll have these debates between Jews and Christians, and the Jew will say, that's not what it means in the context. And the Christian will say, of course that's what it means in the context. And they're both wrong. And that's actually what it says in the New Testament. Luke 24, there's a story where the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, and they're upset. C can we read that? Yeah. We're yeah. supposed to be talking about Mormonism, but I want to talk about this, if that's okay. Please do. As a matter of fact, if you this want to put it on share screen. This is the evangelical talking about the New Testament. Do you want to put it on um, share screen so you can read the Sure. The yeah, let's do that. Yeah. That's a great idea. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Here it is. So I got the King James and the NRSV open here. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered it and found not the body of Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed. Why were they perplexed? If you, as a 21st century Christian, came to the tomb and it was empty, you went back in, in your TARDIS, in your time machine, and you went to the tomb empty, would you be surprised? Probably not. Of no. course not. You'd be oh. screaming, absolutely. This is what I was predicted. And in Luke, that's predicted. Right? So, so now I'm going to put on my hat as the secular scholar, right? In the Gospel of Luke, he says earlier in the Gospel, and someone can post the verse up here or correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I remember he says earlier in the Gospel that he's going to rise on the third day. I think that's in Luke. Um, so wait a minute. So the tomb's empty. They know it's supposed to be empty. Actually, let's look that up. Um, here I'm now thinking as a carrot. I want to make sure I'm not misquoting it. Okay, I love this. Let's You're seeing it. It's all developed right. right now, right in front of us. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, Luke. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, behold, I cast out devil. Oh, yeah. And the third day I shall be perfected. Okay. There's no way to know what he's talking about here, right? Uh -huh. May, certainly if it's, he is referring to the resurrection that's not obvious from this oh here it is the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day now let's assume every word in Luke happens I don't know that it did but let's say it did happen just from an historical perspective let's say it happened and then let's say the sense of when I talked about Jeremiah the reason Luke ended up in the New Testament is because the one that correctly predicted what would happen and there were I'm just saying hypothetically right and there may have been a bunch of Gospels that didn't end up in the New Testament because they didn't. They said it would be on the fourth day or the fifth day. And those aren't in our New Testament because they got it wrong. That's a purely naturalistic explanation, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now let's go back to Luke 24. So if you believe what it says earlier, they should have been expecting that the tomb will be empty. It said it will rise on the third day. Mm -hmm. But instead it says they're perplexed, they're about, because two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Okay. So if at this point you didn't know that he is alive, if that there was a resurrection, now you should know it, right? Mm -hmm. He is not here, but is risen. That seems pretty straightforward. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? That's what we just read. Yep. Saying, so the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, right? Now, again, maybe the whole story is made up. Maybe Jesus never existed. I, I'm, I'm now trying to, ex to look at this and interpret it based on the language and the context, assuming every word here is historical, right? Mm -hmm. a, as a thought experiment. Um, and they remembered his word and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the Mary, the mother of James, etc. Okay. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Yeah. So Jesus said it, according to Luke. Two yeah. angels said it. These other people who are women said it, and they're like, this is nuts. Mm -hmm. the, they're, so he doesn't even believe the tomb's empty, let alone that Jesus rose. They, and I'm going to jump ahead here. And behold, to, no, let's read this. Um, then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves. Shroud of turn, if you believe that. And departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Tomb is empty. At this point, if you're a good Christian... Peter, who's the first pope, who was crucified in Rome as the first pope. Is that right? Is, is he, according to Catholics, the first pope, or is that? I oh, think yeah. he is. Um, yeah. All right. So surely, at this point, he believes Jesus is risen, right? 
And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself knew, drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said to them, what manner of communication are these that you have to another as we walk and are sad? Why are you upset? And one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answering unto, uh, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which are come to pass there? And he, like, you don't know? And he said to them, what things? And what I love about this is this kind of conversation really rings true. What I don't see here is the second person of the triune God, which might be true, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't believe in the Trinity. That's a matter of faith. But two Jews talking on the road to Emmaus aren't going to know about the, about the triune deity, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to say the thing about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, right? That's a Jewish way of explaining what happened, right? There was this prophet named Jesus of Nazareth. Whether you believe he's a prophet or not, that's a different question. But the people believe, some people believed in him. And now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been the he which should re have redeemed Israel. This is important. Let's read this in a different translation. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Somewhere here I have the NIV, which some people say is the nearly inspired version. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Okay. What does that mean? As a Jew, it's obvious to me what this means. What does it mean that hoped he would redeem Israel? We're being ruled by the Romans. We're, as a nation, we don't have sovereignty and we're humiliated by a foreign power. We're looking for a Messiah, which is prophesied in the Hebrew Bible, at least I believe is prophesied in certain passages, Isaiah 2, for example, um, Isaiah 11. We're looking for a descendant of David who will defeat the enemies of Israel, gather in the exiles, and bring peace to the world. And that's what they're looking for. He's, we're hoping he was going to redeem Israel. But the Romans still rule, and he's dead. And, and on top of all that, the greatest humiliation is the tomb is empty. What kind of Christians are these? Mm. They should be jumping for joy the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. And besides all this, to the, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found out his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. Right, it's idle talk to them, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us, meaning Peter, according to Luke, went to the sepulcher and found even so, as the women had said. But him they saw not. So they're still expecting that he's dead. He's failed. He's a failed Messiah as far as they believe. He was supposed to redeem Israel, but he didn't. We had hoped he'd redeem Israel, but he didn't. Now, this isn't a Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus saying this. This is the Gospel of Luke. And what's Luke's point? The next part is what the point is. Then he said it to them, O oh, fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Obviously, they thought up until now, until now, no. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures thing, the things concerned, concerning himself. In other words, according to Luke, the only reason they thought that, Isaiah, that Hosea 11.1 1 was that Jesus would be called out of Egypt by God his father is because that was revealed to them by Jesus himself. Mm. That's what this is saying. Or maybe somebody else figured it out through some kind of revelatory process. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, etc. Okay, so up until now, their eyes are, in New Testament terms, sealed, and they can't see these things. okay. And it's only Jesus who uncovers their eyes and allows them to see it. So here's where I have a problem. When the Christian goes to the Jew, what's wrong with you? How do you not see that all these prophecies refer to Jesus? Well, the disciples didn't see it, even on the third day when the tomb was empty. Why don't I see it? Mm -hmm. And if you see it, according to Luke, it was because it was revealed to you, not because you're clever or smart. And it wasn't certainly wasn't revealed to Matthew because Matthew was so clever, he opened up the... Up the book of Isaiah and saw there was something about a virgin. No, in the context, it has nothing to do with Jesus. It's about King Ahaz, and he's being invaded by these two uh, armies, mm -hmm. and there's a young woman who gives birth. So how did Matthew come to the conclusion it was about a virgin? According to Luke, it was revealed to him. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way he could have known it. That's the message of Luke. Now, you don't have to believe in Luke. You don't have to accept Luke. 
But that's, the, I think, the message that Luke and, and other passages in the New Testament, but here very clearly, is communicating. And we have this disconnect when a Jew and a Christian have an argument, and the Christian says it's obvious that we're right about our interpretation of um, of Matthew or Luke or, or really of Isaiah. And the Jew says, how could you possibly read Isaiah and come to that conclusion? We don't know what you're talking about. Fair enough. Well, when the Jew reads, don't go to a kid in its mother's milk, and he says it means don't eat meat milk together. And you say, how could it possibly mean that? He says, because <laughs> you don't know it when Moses was told on Mount Sinai. Yeah. And what the Christian should be saying is, okay, you don't know it was revealed to us by Jesus or by the authors of the Gospels, which got it from Jesus or the Holy Spirit or whatever. That should be what the conversation is. And I think that could be a more respectful conversation. Instead of, you stupid guys, don't you realize that's not what it means in its context? Or it is what it means in its context? I, I think there could be a lot more... Um, Productive dialogue, if, 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 if we defined what our terms are, and we understand why is it that we believe this, because this is the only way to read that we don't even read, we don't even interpret it, we just read it. No, you do interpret it. Now you interpret it based on a set of values and a set of concepts, right? The rabbinical set of concepts is we know it's forbidden to eat meat and milk together. Every Jew knows that there's not a dispute about that, except for those crazy carrots, whatever. Um, but we know in Second Temple times, or we think in Second Temple times, there were Jews who didn't eat meat and milk together. It goes back a long way, right? It's not a new concept. Um, and when you read, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk, you just don't know the missing context. And for the Christian, when you read, behold, the virgin will give birth to a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. Okay, you think it's talking about something in the time of King Ahaz, and it was talking about something in the time of King Ahaz, but prophetically, it's talking about Jesus. And why do we believe that? Because it's in the Gospel of Matthew, mm -hmm. not could, does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, and it, and I always tell people too. I said, you know, because you know, this is with the Alma, you know, being, meaning young young woman, right? You know, and so, mm -hmm. so and, and so and, and I often I tell people I said the reason why Jesus had to be born of a virgin was not because mm -hmm. it was required by the Jewish scriptures; it was because it was the requirement uh, of the Greek culture that he be born of a virgin. Uh, that's okay. All. You know, in, in in that context, in other words, because because, mm -hmm. and again, I'm, I'm not trying to do you know sloppy apologetics mm -hmm. here. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to say that that because this is a Greek, the the Greek mind, the mindset, the you know this mm -hmm. Roman world, and of course still influenced by the Greek, mm -hmm. the, the Hellenization of this kind of thing, but also because Christianity was the reintroduction of monotheism to the broader world, to the Gentile world. That in order for it to be acceptable within that context, that Jesus would have had to have been born of a virgin for those people, not for the Jewish people. Does that make sense to you? So it's really interesting. There's this ancient book called The Lives of the Prophets. Um, it's part of the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. And there's some debate among historians about whether it was written by Jews in the Second Temple period and then expanded by Christians or whether it was written in the Byzantine period by Christians. Either way, it describes... Um, let's say the Christian part of the book describes um, Isis and her son as prophetically um, foretelling the coming of G Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it basically explains, this is how we know that, that Jesus is, is, is truly who he says he is, because even the pagans knew this would happen. And they made statues of Mary and Jesus before Jesus was ever born. Right? So whoever wrote that, they're looking at the statues of Isis and, and Jesus, and they're saying, this doesn't destroy our faith, it strengthens my faith. It proves that this was going to happen. Now you could say, oh no, that was pagan, right? And it was pagan. right? But for those people who wrote that, this part of the lives of the prophets, the Byzantine phase of it, they're looking at the statues of Isis and Horus, and I might be getting those names wrong, I'm not an Egyptologist, um, and they're saying, okay, th this, this proves Jesus is real. Right, and and this strengthens the faith of faith of an Egyptian who came out of a culture believing in Isis and Horus that the mother would be holding the child. Right, I mean, it, so what you're saying is actually, and look, uh, there, it's interesting. Justin Martyr is this really fascinating figure because he's the earliest figure that I know of to have a debate with a Jew that's been recorded. But he wrote two major works. One is against, uh, um, no, not against. Sorry, um, uh, dialogues with Trifo, uh, which is. Trifo is the Jew, possibly Rabbi Tarfon mentioned in the Mishnah, maybe, maybe not. Um, but somebody from that period, roughly, from the mid-2nd century, early mid-2nd century. Um, and then the other one he writes is, is the um, is the Apologia, which is directed at Christian. Oh, sorry, directed at 
Greek and Roman pagans. And to the Greek and Roman pagans, he says, look, you knew these things were going to happen. You have these ideas in your gods. And to the Jew, he takes the opposite view, right? He's saying, look, you knew this was going to happen. It's even in your scriptures. And he quotes the Isaiah 714. So depending on what the context is, he brings different arguments, which I think is really interesting, right? He, he um, And again, you, you know, you could say either he was stupid and he didn't realize his own internal contradiction, or he said, okay, I need to present this differently depending on the context, right? In a sense, it was something I know is true. How do I present it to somebody who doesn't know it's true? So look, I mean, that's what Dan Vogel says about Joseph Smith Jr., that he knew these doctrines were true, he knew that Alvin, his dead brother, was going to be saved. And he needed to convince his father. Right? That's that's Dan Vogel's argument. And how does he convince his father? He's not going to listen to him. So he makes up a story about the Book of Mormon, right? About the golden plates. And now, is that what happened? It depends if you believe it or not, right? Right. Um, I mean, so, that's look, there, there's another possibility that Joseph Smith was a schizophrenic and he heard voices. And some of his voices said these different things, right? That's another possibility, right? That's what uh, C.S. Lewis famously said about Jesus. He said he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord, right? Or lunatic that's or a liar. Yep. Right. Yep. I mean, yeah. Um, well, and, that's, and, th and again, th that's one argument that C.S. Lewis could make about Jesus, but also the, the question then be, it could be he was none of those, but the- It could be a combination of them or none of the above, right? You're absolutely right. right. That, that 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 was imposed upon him by later you know traditions and 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 the scriptures that that he was so so that's other ways of looking at it too see and this is these are the kind of things that I grapple with because I was an atheist and I went through this whole deconstruction process and then I look at the challenges of faith because like for, as a Jew you're probably not very well convinced about using pagan arguments in favor of of Christianity is probably not a very compelling argument that you're going to make but what I love <laughs> it's not compelling at all right yeah but what I love about you is that you're approaching mm -hmm. other faith traditions like Christianity and Messianic Judaism or Messianic Christianity, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. And you're mm -hmm. you're you're doing it in a way that I think is very similar than what I'm trying to do, which is try mm -hmm. to understand people from where they're at, what are their, their traditions, what do they believe, and then just come on the program and talk about them and do it in a safe space. And I think that what you and I are doing are extraordinarily similar things. That's why I said sure. earlier, yeah. we're brothers from another mother. You know, so, so here's how I look at it. So I believe a lot of things that if you're Dan Vogel or you're an atheist, you would think it's ridiculous. You believe yes. that there's a supernatural being who created the universe. Let's say he did through billions of years, however you want to you know, take it. But that there's this supernatural being. You know, uh, what's the guy's name? The, the, fam uh, the famous atheist. Um, help me out here. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, yeah. Or, or um, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, no, the guy before in billions and billions of years, what was that guy? Carl saying? Sagan. Carl Sagan. Yeah, Carl Sagan. He says, You believe in the supernatural being who created the universe? I just cut out one of the steps. Okay. Yeah, fair I, enough. See, all right. That that's fair. Now I hear what he believes, and I'm like, how do you have enough faith to believe that the world is all random ha happenstance? That the world itself is eternal. That essentially the world itself is God, right? Um, oh well, there wasn't time. Okay. Uh, we say in Hebrew, you know, nevertheless, uh, at some point there had to be some beginning if, if there's no time, right? And what was before the beginning? Well, nothing. Okay, well, I believe there was something. So I believe something that 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 um, Hitchens or Dawkins thinks is ridiculous. And I want to have enough respect where if you're a Mormon or if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim and you believe things that I don't believe, I want to have enough respect that I'm not treating you the way that Dawkins treats me and says, oh, some stupid, uh, silly Jewish superstition from thousands of years ago. Okay, I understand you see it that way, but I look at a lot of things in my own life and my own experiences. I mentioned to you the, you know, look, in high school, I went to a Jewish high school, and a lot of the people would have these conversations about why would we think God actually exists just because we were told that as kids. And I'm thinking, I saw Elijah. So I, I mean, mm. like, I can't, I couldn't even go there that God doesn't exist. Because I saw Elijah, and I had other experiences that I'm not going to talk about. Maybe I'll never talk about. But um, but the point is, okay, I was an eight-year-old, and I was primed to believe that. Right? You can come up with rationalistic explanations. Sure. And I want to be mature enough that I can have the conversation and say, okay, I was a little kid. We had just been talking about Elijah appearing to people and how ridiculous it was. Um, 
And so somehow subconsciously that primed me to see him. I don't know, you could come up with that explanation. But I had this experience and it's very real to me. And if somebody had an experience with Jesus, I don't want to discount that. I didn't have that experience. You did. Um, so I want to be respectful of that and try to understand, let's say, the New Testament on your terms. And I want to understand the Quran and the terms of the people who believe in the Quran. And I want to, I want the respect to be given for me to interpret the Tanakh on the terms of the Tanakh. I want to talk about, and I don't know that I should do this, but... Um, well, let, let's say this. I won't name names. There's an approach out there, which is which is a um, an historical um, uh, naturalistic approach, and it goes like this. It says um, they found a copy of the Book of Deuteronomy in the temple in Jerusalem in the time of King Hilkiah, mm -hmm. and they were lying. Yes, and that's it was actually a man named Hilkiah or Shaphan. Who just made up that book? And why did he do it? Because he wanted to centralize power in Jerusalem. They right. call it the reform of King Josiah. Mm -hmm. And for historians who believe that, or who argue that, the book of Deuteronomy is no different than the, the book, book of Mormon. It's exa exactly. And now, it's, a little bit different. That. it's a little bit different because there, there were earlier books that talked about this man named Moses, that talked about the Exodus. Right. But where they wanted to centralize power in Jerusalem, they wrote a book called Deuteronomy or Proto Deuteronomy, whatever, right? Um, not the Deuteronomy we have today, but the, the core of Deuteronomy. That, oh, did I lose you here? And they were lying. It was it was all a falsification. That that's the argument of secular historians. And then they say, what was the religion of ancient Israel? The religion of ancient Israel didn't have the 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 sacrifices centralized in Jerusalem. In fact, what Deuteronomy describes as the false faith, I'm going to use modern terms, right? The false religion where you sacrifice on top of every hill and under every leafy tree and you have a statue of Asherah because Deuteronomy says to cut down the, stat, the, the tree of Asherah. <clears throat> and it says to smash their, their, um, uh, their idols. So the original religion of Israel was they worshipped idols. Yep. And that was accepted, and it was it was the true original religion of ancient Israel, and it was these upstarts who wrote Deuteronomy in the, under the the reign of Josiah that made up this. You shouldn't have statues, and you shouldn't have idols. Okay, I understand where they're coming from. <clears throat> Essentially, it's, it's really interesting. So you had this institution in first temp, let's say before the time of Josiah. Josiah, they say six twenty one BCE. Let's call it that, right? So in 700 BCE and earlier, 650 BC and earlier, you had this institution called the High Places. And no one disputes that on top of every hill and under every leafy tree, I don't know if nobody disputes, but we found these buildings or we found remnants of them. You have these altars where they're sacrificing all over the places. And according to the prophets, they're sinning. But let's say you were a priest of one of those high places. Where we just read about in Gideon, there was the prophet Ananiah, the son of Azur. And in, Gide in Gibeon, do they have a statue of Yahweh or Yehovah? Probably. And do they have a, a, a pole of Asherah? Almost certainly. So if, according to Deuteronomy, right? So if you're, if you're one of those priests of the high places, you think, wait a minute, this is the religion that we've been doing for hundreds of years since the time of Moses. Now, did Moses exist or not? Well, if you're a secular atheist, you probably think he didn't exist, right? But they believe he existed, right? So, you're, or maybe they did, maybe they did. It seems like they did because there's, we're told in uh, Judges that there was this high place in the city of Dan. Uh, do you know about this? About the um, about the hanging nun? No, no. Tell me, tell me about it. Things in, in the in the in the Hebrew Bible when you look at the manuscripts. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. All so right. there's this. So there's a story in the book of Judges that um, the story in the book of Judges is that there are these people, there's these Danites, the original Danites, um, and they're from the tribe of Dan, and they're looking for, for a territory to settle in, and they kidnap this priest who isn't a real priest, because to be a priest, you have to be a descendant of Aaron, and he's just a Levite. And this is something Christians misunderstand. Levite is a tribe, and within that tribe, there was the Aaronites who were the priests. Every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. Okay. 
according again to Deuteronomy and Numbers, right? Uh, if you believe in in the Torah, that's what it says, right? And also the Book of Kings as well. Um, okay, so um, so according to Judges, there's this Levite who isn't an Aaronite. It seems it just calls him a Levite, and he make and he becomes a priest with a statue. It's a whole story. You guys can read it in the end of the Book of Judges. And they kidnap him and they take him to Dan. And it says they set up the statue in Dan, the statue of Yahweh, of Yehovah. And you know that so in the Hebrew we have the name of God, Yud Hevav, hey, I pronounce it Yehovah. Other people say Yahweh. We, that's a whole separate discussion. We don't have to get into that, right? So, but they have a statue of Yud Hevav, hey, the God of Israel. And it's a silver statue. And it says he was a priest there at the temple of Dan. Let's read it. Um, it's a really cool passage. Um you know. All right. So, uh, and here's something you would get from the Hebrew and in the manuscripts that you don't get when you read it in English. That's, what, that's why I love to go to the source here. So, um, of course, we don't have the original one that was written in the time of Judges, but like they have with the Book of Mormon, they have the original one dictated by Joseph Smith, which is actually very impressive, I have to say. Um, I was surprised when I learned that. Um, but in any event, we have uh, something that's been transmitted from that time uh, in some form or another. Um, let's see. Oh, here it is. So I'm going to read you here. here. Let's pull up the King James. Uh, how do we do share screen? Here it, it just, is. There we go. All right. All right. So this is, um, no, let's see. Where is this? Here it is. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And, jo and, and there's no question that whoever wrote the book of Joshua, or sorry, the book of Judges, is criticizing this, right? This is a horrible thing. Okay. But the people of Dan don't think this is a horrible thing, obviously, or they would have done it. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, when's the captivity of the land? maybe sometime around 732 BCE. It's sometime during the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The um, city of Dan in that region is conquered and those people are taken as exiles. So until that event took place, so when does this take place? Let's call it 1350 BCE, give or take, right? Again, give or take 100 years. And then they go into exile something like 600 years later, I'm bad at math, so somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Hundreds of years later, they go into exile. So this is obviously written after they go into exile. But it's telling the story from the perspective of somebody who clearly believes that this is an illegitimate place of worship because they have a graven image. But there's some kind of, why is he saying the name of the father and the grandfather of Jonathan? Who cares that his father's name was Gershom and his grandfather's name was Manasseh? Why is that important? So you wouldn't know why it's important unless you look in the Hebrew. And in this version, I don't see it. Actually, I see a little note here, but I'll show you what it looks like in the manuscripts. So this is Judges 8, 1830. Let me pull it up in, in a, uh, hopefully I can find this in the Aleppo Codex. Oh, no, here, let's look here. I think I have this on my computer somewhere. Hold on, I'm doing a little search here, and I hope we're not going too long because we've been oh, going no, for several. Fine. I'm actually enjoying this conversation. You know, and this, and, and just so you know, this, we're we're just going to have to continue this dialogue. Where this is very fascinating right. stuff. So we're going to continue talking, but I also know that we there are so many things that we talked about today that are just re, are going to require you coming back. Right. Uh, because let me show you this. This is the Aleppo Codex, and I'm, I'd be happy to come back on and continue. So this is Judges 18:30 in the Aleppo Codex, and what I did here just to to be clear, is I, um, in Photoshop, I made all the words around it light, and this is the original color, more or less, right? Okay. Um, so all of this is the same color in the manuscript. I just made it, so if you didn't read Hebrew, you'd know which word to look at. Okay. So here it says, Jonathan, Yohanatan, Ben Gilshom, the son of Gilshom, Ben Menashe, the son of Menashe. And the nun here in the word Menashe is different than the words around it, the letters around it. You see that? Okay. It's yeah. written above the line. And in the margin, it says, Dalit Tuyim, which means it's one of four letters that's hanging. And what does hanging mean? That means it's not written above the line by accident. In every manuscript, it's supposed to be written that way. That's what it means. Okay. Now, why is it written that way? 
Well, it's pretty obvious it's written that way because somebody added the nun. Okay. And if you take out the nun, this letter, it says this man's name, this priest in the in the temple at Dan, who worshipped the God of Israel, Yehovah or Yahweh, through a silver statue. His name was Jonathan, the son of Gershom, and without the nun, the son of Moshe, the son of Moses. Okay. So, imagine now you're someone who believes in the um, in the temple of Yehovah, the temple of Yahweh at Dan, and you have a priest there whose descendants, until around 750 BCE, they can claim a direct chain of transmission. Father to son, a line of priests that go back to Moses. That's the claim here. Now, why is there? Why was the nun added? Because someone was embarrassed. Oh no, Moses's grandson was a priest. First of all, he's not from Aaron. He's because Aaron is Moses's brother. Someone is is he's he's the grandson of Moses, and he has a temple at Dan with a silver statue. This is a disaster. Wow. So they added Nun to protect the honor of Moses. And pretty much nobody disputes that that's the explanation. And I'm sure somebody disputes it. But even Jewish sources acknowledge that that's the explanation. Okay. Wow. So Moses had a grandson who, who was a priest with a silver statue of God. Right? He's not worshiping Baal. He's right. worshiping God of Israel. So it's amazing. Yeah. And the chain of transmission, the chain of a, the proof of their authority. It's interesting. Mormons talk a lot about authority. The proof of authority of the line of priests in Dan is that, you know, my name is um, Zenon or whatever, right? I don't know. We don't know their names. But I can trace my lineage directly back to Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of, Men of Moses. That was the claim of authority up until the time of the exile, according to Judges. Now, what's Judges doing? Whoever wrote this in Judges is saying this is horrible. But whoever went and brought sacrifices at Dan thought this is amazing. He must have thought it was amazing or they wouldn't have brought the sacrifices. Right? And they're making a claim of authority that can be traced in a direct line back to Moses. Um, and, and the point is, we have the smoking gun of this with that nun that's above the line, changing it to Menashe to protect the honor of Moses. Now, when I hear people who will tell me, you know, the Israelites before Josiah, the god Yahweh, he had a wife named Asherah. Mm -hmm. well, I know there's people who believe that. We're told yeah. that in the book of Deuteronomy, and we're told that in Jeremiah, and we're told that in Isaiah, but it's criticized by our prophets. So to me, they said, you know, it's interesting, in, in Mormonism, there's a lot of things, there's a whole thing about the apologists, right? So I hear these, these, these scholars who will say the original god Yahweh he had a wife named Asherah, and that's the original faith of Israel. They're apologists of the high places, and they really are, because they say the high places are the original faith of Israel. Yeah. So they'll say, oh, Nehemia, you're an apologist for, for essentially um, the Josianic, I mean, the, the book of Deuteronomy that came from Josiah. Fair enough, I believe that Josiah didn't make it up, and Hilkiah didn't make it up. He was the priest who found it. I believe that, that Moses, maybe Joshua and others wrote this, right? Um, and you want to call me an apologist for the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, that's my faith. I believe it. But they're no different. They're apologists for the for Hananiah, the son of Azur. They're apologists for Asherah. And I don't have a problem with them being apologists for the Asherah worship, but they should acknowledge that. And the way they present it is this is the only truth, and you're an idiot if you don't believe this. You just don't understand that this is what all this, this is what all me and my friends agree on. Yeah, I know you and your friends agree on that. And me and my ancestors for the last 3,500 years, or at least since the time of Josiah, we believe something else. Now, are we wrong? I don't think we're wrong. And you don't think you're wrong. But let's have the humility. You know, I think they call it the epistemic humility. Yes. Let's have the humility to, to, to acknowledge I believe this because my presupposition is that bo the book of Deuteronomy wasn't made up by Hilkiah or Shaphan or Josiah. It wasn't a pious fraud. But I understand why you believe it was. And if I'm right, 
then the original religion of Moses rejected Asherah and rejected um, Moses would have rejected his own grandson, um, certainly for having a statue, whether for a high place is a different debate. Um, because in Deuteronomy, it says, don't make a statue of God. And he did make a statue of God out of silver, and he brought sacrifices before that statue. So, so you know, that there's there's this, um, and let's have the humility when we talk about Mormonism to realize that in some respects, we're doing the same thing as the people who say Asherah is the, uh, that Asherah is the original religion of Israel, right? Um, if you believe the Book of Mormon, then there was a guy named Nephi and another guy named Lehi. And if you don't, then there wasn't, right? Yeah. And maybe there was a Book of Mormon also isn't true, right? That's the third possibility that you mentioned, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important that we acknowledge what our presuppositions are. Mm -hmm. Now, I might have a bunch of good reasons why I have my presuppositions. Maybe they're good, maybe they're not, right? Um, right? What's one of the reasons that they say Asherah is the original religion of Israel? Well, we find Asherah mentioned in the earliest inscriptions that mention Yahweh. Right, we have the um, Kuntalatha Druid um, uh, inscriptions that I saw in the Israel Museum in the '90s before they turned them over to the Egyptians. The uh, Israeli archaeologists found during our occupation of the Sinai Peninsula, and they mention Yehovah and his Asherah. And then we have the Chirbet Al Kom inscription, which also mentioned Asherah. Okay, and according to Jeremiah, those were false worshippers of Yehovah. Right, and they feel the same about Jeremiah, and you can actually see that in in the Hebrew Bible. There's this great scene where uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in, in the Hebrew Bible, where um, Israel is invaded by the Assyrians, and um, this is the time of King Hezekiah, and they come to Hezekiah, the Assyrians, and they say, "You got to surrender." And there's a guy named Rav Shake. He's the Assyrian general. So Rav Shakeh says, you guys have to surrender. And he says, who, who are you trusting? Yahweh, whose altars you destroyed? You're saying that he's going to protect you against my master, the king of Assyria? You destroyed his altars. Now, what's he talking about there? So Hezekiah went and destroyed the high places. This is before Josiah, by the way. Um, why did he destroy the high places? Because he read Deuteronomy, I believe. And in also Leviticus 17, that's a different discussion. Um, and according to that, there's only one place you're allowed to worship. Right? Originally, that was a mobile place, the tabernacle, according to the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel 24. That became the temple in Jerusalem or the Temple Mount. Um, of course, they'll say that was written by somebody who believed in the book of Deuteronomy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but the point is that I asked myself the question, so Rav Shakeh is an Assyrian general. How does he know Hezekiah destroyed some altar of the God of Israel on some hilltop somewhere, right? I mean, think about it. Judea is a backwater somewhere mm -hmm. from the perspective of the Assyrian Empire. It would be like an American general goes to a mosque in you know, Baghdad and he says, you know, how can you trust an Allah, you... Uh, um, and I don't know the details there, right? You insulted Aisha, the mother of, of the faith, right? The American general, they don't even know the Jewish and she has the Sunnis, mm -hmm. literally, in many cases. Let alone that there's a debate about the role of Aisha in early Islam, right? One of them says that she's the mother of the faithful. The other says she's like the spawn of Satan or something. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. But there's a debate about this woman named Aisha, who was one of the wives of Muhammad. No American general knows about that. So how does, how does um, uh, Rav Shakeh know that? Because he must have Judean collaborators who go to him and say, that Hezekiah, the people hate him. And why do they hate him? Because he destroyed our altars. This is the altar where my father brought sacrifices. My grandfather, my great-grandfather going back 800 years, and that guy Hezekiah destroyed our altar. Right. So that's the narrative of the apology of the high, and I mean in the sense of defense, right? The apologist of the high places says Hezekiah was a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And we essentially have that in mainstream scholarship, high place apologetics being presented as objective fact. And anybody who doesn't agree with that fact, oh, you, you're just ignorant or yeah. you're a fundamentalist. Yeah, that's really, wow. What a, yeah, it's mind-blowing. 
It is mind blowing. And it's, it's also fascinating too, is that, you know, if I'm trying to like, what is a history's written by the victors type kind of thing? Why do I even have any of this stuff in my scriptures, man? Wouldn't you want to totally whitewash the fact that they were doing high places? Would you want to totally whitewash it? There's a descendant of Moses that's doing this kind of stuff. Well, it says they did whitewash it by changing. Well, I, Moshe to I mean, if, I, mean right? I would have even they left the smoking gun, which right. is they say, when you write this. Yeah. If you change the Bible, make sure you leave the trace that that letter is written above the line. Yeah. As an yeah. addition. That's what I find so fascinating. It, it actually yeah. tells me that we're dealing with real history yeah. here. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and that this isn't like, like it's messy. And it's also very yeah. interesting to me because like, I think, I think it's very talking. messy. I agree with you. Yeah. And so, I, but I think one of the things about, about Israelite Jewish history, I also I use Jewish and Israelite here interchangeable. All of our shameful things are, are bared before the world. Exactly. All of our mistakes, all of our imperfections, um, things we read in the Old Testament were like, oh, I wish he wouldn't have said that. Yeah. I'll give you an example. So um, Amnon, who is one of the sons of David, he wants to rape his sister. What? What's the in the Bible? Because it happened. And what does she say? What is it? It's his half-sister. What does she say to him? Go ask my father, our father, and he'll give you permission, but don't rape me. Whoa. Will David really give his son permission to have sex with his daughter? Now, maybe she's saying that in the moment of desperation. But then we look at Abram, and he married his half-sister. So maybe that was a thing. Now, it's forbidden in the Torah. We're told it's an abominable thing. But we're also told there are people who did it in the Torah. So what's that do doing there? Now, did somebody just make that up? Sure, maybe somebody made it up. I don't believe that. But if they made it up, you'd think they'd make up a, a um, there was a concept called the the um, argument from embarrassment. Yeah, criterion of embarrassment. Or yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. right. yeah. So there's something to that. I think so. It doesn't mean that it's true, because you could. I mean, let let let's uh, let's take the example of Mormonism, right? Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith says. An angel told me that you have to marry me or he'll kill me. He says, so, uh, isn't that right? It's according to some of the sources. Yeah, with the flaming okay. sword. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think he probably really said that. Yeah. But did he really see the angel with the flaming sword? I don't think so. Okay. It just proves he said it, not that what he mm -hmm. said was true. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, the argument from embarrassment. And it isn't always true. There are sometimes embarrassing things that are made up. Um that happens in, in, in the world. Um, so, but yeah, it, I, I think there's, there's, it, it's, it's a valid argument. It doesn't mean it's always true though. Right. But yeah, there's certainly no. a lot of embarrassment in the Hebrew Bible about the history of Israel. Yeah. And, and actually, and it's it actually in one sense, even kind of strengthens Mormonism in the sense that there's a lot of embarrassing things in the early history of that church. We yeah. have the institution of polygamy. We have the Fanny Alger affair. You have the very human prophet just like joseph smith's a very human man david's mm. a very human man they're mm. not they're not put on pedestals they're actually yeah. to me it actually gives more credence to mormonism in the sense that it it has and i always tell people too i say listen listen i said right around the time that mormonism has started imagine a situation in which you have jesus's ministry is going on as we speak and there's somebody writing a book Con contemporary to Jesus called Christianity Unveiled, just like there was Mormonism, Mormonism Unveiled at that time when Joseph was still around. That our view of that Jesus does exist, by the way, and we can talk about that in a minute. What's that? That book does exist. It's yeah. called Told with Yeshu. It's oh. the rabbinical retelling of the story of Jesus. And in Told with Yeshu, Jesus really does perform miracles. Well, he's like a sorcerer, isn't he viewed as a but sorcerer? But he uses the power of the name of God to perform magic. And there's this bizarre scene where Judas Iscariot has more powerful magic than Jesus and shows that he's a more powerful magician than Jesus using the power of the name. And so, yeah, you could say that's the Jewish version of Mormonism unveiled. Well, right? when was that written? Now, though? When was that written? A couple hundred years later. But it's, okay, an so yeah, that's... it's true. In the history of Mormonism, everything is telescoped. Yeah. That, that's why when, when Dan Vogel talks about an anachronism, it's something that happened like 40 years after the events, and he uses the word anachronism, right? 
Whereas in Judaism and in, in Christian history, it's hundreds of years later, usually. Yeah. Or decades at the very least, right? Yeah. Th no, that's a great, great way of looking at it. Everything is compressed. And yeah. also, this is the other thing. Yeah. Actually, you brought this up to me in our last conversation. I mm -hmm. have to bring it up. And you had said yeah. that you really kind of reconsidered the way you would approach scriptures vis-a-vis -vis even the New Testament and even some Old Testament scriptures and how the thought was, is that like, for instance, I think you're we referring to uh, First Timothy, where Paul, mm -hmm. uh, it appears to have two different authors, because in one sense, Paul's talking about, hey, you're going to see Jesus before you die. And then later right. on, seems to contradict himself saying, well, no, it, it, it's the phrase, and, and someone will correct us in the comments, but it's something to the effect of the dead in Christ. Yes. And that's brought as one of the arguments, how we know that one of these letters was written by Paul, and the other one was either by a disciple of Paul, if you're coming from, let's say, the Dallas Theological Seminary, or from right. Aaron, it's an example he brings in the book Forged, right? Yeah. It's a forgery pretending to be Paul. Right. And he uses the same phrase, but he uses it in a different way. Right. Okay. Well, we actually see that. I mean, it's amazing. In early Mormonism, we have examples of that where he talks about, and I discussed this with Dan Vogel in my, in my interview with him, um, uh, my, in my Hebrew Voices podcast, where, um, uh, and something again, we'll post in the comments the details, right? But you have this discussion in the new, in the in the Book of Mormon of about it talks about eternal suffering and various forms of formulations, right? And then Joseph Smith has one of his revelations to Mar uh, Martin Harris. Um, am I getting that name right? Um, uh, who was the scribe? Was his name Martin Harris? Or no, Harris? he was one of the, well, Oliver Cowdery was yeah. his. His yeah, so the, the first one who his wife burned, presumably. Yeah, yeah. So Martin Harris was the, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, Martin Harris. So there's a revelation that's given to Martin Harris where he says, um, who doesn't believe in eternal punishment. And he's saying, oh, no, eternal punishment means punishment from the eternal one. <clears throat> Meaning it's not eternal. It's And we can't tell people this because if we tell people this, they'll say, okay, I'll sin a little bit. This is a great scene in The Sopranos. I love The Sopranos. This is a great scene where one of the mobsters um, he has a dream that he's in hell. And hell is a bar. And every night he loses uh, cards to the Irish. And he's whacked like he was whacked in life, meaning murdered. And um, and the other guy thinks about this and he says, wait a minute, you weren't in hell. You were in purgatory. And you suffer for a few thousand years. I could do that time standing on my head. And, uh, and so Joseph Smith is saying, if we tell people that punishment isn't eternal, they'll just come as well sin. And I'll suffer for a few thousand years for the pleasures here in life, right? Uh, so he kind of anticipated the Sopranos. Um, and, and so the point is eternal punishment in the Book of Mormon means eternal punishment. That's the shot, the plain meaning. Yep. But before the book came off the presses, Joseph Smith has already had a revelation that eternal punishment means temporary punishment at the hands of the eternal one. So in, in the context of any other, philo look, I'm a philologist, I study ancient texts. In any other example in philology, we would say author A used the term eternal punishment in the sense of eternal punishment, and author B comes along and reinterprets it because he's a different author and has a different set of exactly. concepts. Right. Yet we see within a, within a matter of, of a year or two, Joseph Smith is teaching two opposite, that's if you believe right. Joseph Smith wrote both of them. Right. If you believe in the fallen prophet theory, the first one comes from Nephi and Lehi and God, and the other one comes from Joseph Smith, right? Um, but, but let's assume, for argument's sake, that Joseph Smith made up both of those, both the Doctrine and Covenants, um, Revelation, and the Book of Mormon. So Joseph Smith, who is the author, he himself is presenting both concepts right. within a very short period of time. And that blew my mind when I learned that. I'm like... Right. This challenges everything in philology, and, it, and it's not just the Old Testament. When we study Maimonides, we say, well, Maimonides didn't write that work attributed to him. He was a rabbi who died in 1204 uh, in Spain and later in um, uh, Egypt. He's one of the great scholars of medieval Judaism. Maimonides didn't write that document, that book that's attributed to him, because Maimonides is a completely different concept of the afterlife. Or he didn't. He just changed his mind. Or he didn't even change his mind. And we have examples of that from Maimonides, where it's not that he changed his mind. He was talking, to, and it's specifically about the afterlife. He's talking to two different audiences. Mm -hmm. When he's talking to a bunch of laymen, he presents what you might call a very fundamentalist view of the afterlife. This is Maimonides. When Maimonides is talking to a Jew who's saying, I don't think Judaism is true because I read the Greek philosophers and this doesn't make any sense. 
Well, there he gives you a very rationalistic perspective. That's yeah. in a book called Guide to the Perplexed. And there it's a completely different doctrine. And if you didn't know both of them were written by Maimonides, you'd say there's Maimonides and Pseudo-Maimonides. Yes. There's Paul and there's Pseudo-Paul. Or maybe right. they're both Paul and he changed his maybe mind. Paul. That's what, that's what, when you share that to me. Yeah, that and that yeah. just that opens up the, the way. Now, now, now we could say that maybe there weren't multiple authors. That maybe Paul did write what the, these these letters, mm -hmm. because even though they contradict each other, actually we have shown that in the modern sense yeah. of scripture making, in that okay, just this all yeah. we're kind of taking a naturalistic position, which I think is a reasonable one to take for this yeah. uh, for the sake of this argument that you have the yeah. same author of the Book of Mormon, also mm -hmm. the same author of this of this doctrine of this uh, revelation. Right. You would think these were cut, written by two separate authors, but they're not. It's written by the same person. So you, the would argument that out, Paul, you would jump out of an introduction to a historical phonology class if you said those were written by the same author. But we know they were. And, and let's think about the Torah, right? Let's assume that Moses wrote it. Maybe Moses, and let's assume that Moses just made the whole thing up, again, for the argument's sake. Yeah. So Leviticus, he writes one thing, and 30 or 40 years later in Deuteronomy, he writes something else. I mean, if Joseph Smith can change his mind within one year, why can't Moses? Right. Wow. Yeah. And they'll say, oh, well, what was the reason that Moses didn't go into the land? There's a contradiction there. And in one place it says he hit the rock, and the other place it was because of the spies. Maybe it's both. Maybe he changed his mind. Maybe there were multiple reasons. Things are complicated. Yeah. Right? Wow. And 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 I could always understand how you could say that as a believing Jew, as a believing Christian, as a fundamentalist, in a sense. But you can actually say that as a, as a objective philologist. Doesn't mean it's right, but you could hypothetically say that. And you asked, "Am I a, am I a literalist?" So within Jewish sources, there's a, a an opinion that, for example, the Book of Job is all just an allegory. And nobody says, "Oh, those were Jews who didn't believe who said it was an allegory." It was just rabbis 2,000 years ago who said, you know, come on, Satan wasn't having a conversation with God. It's a metaphor to help us understand there are things in the universe that we don't understand. All right? It's it's an extreme expression of how why bad things happen to good people. Right? And and this isn't like a secular perspective. Right? Did Job happen? I have no idea. It doesn't make any difference to me. Did any Exodus happen? I absolutely believe the Exodus happened. Could it be all an allegory? I suppose anything's possible. I say anything's possible. You're right. You know, the, the Bible could have been written by little green men, right? We don't know, mm -hmm. right? It really does come down to what you believe. I love there's this this uh, Dawkins uh, thing where he says, uh, they say, can you believe that there's a God who created uh, the universe? No, absolutely not. What about aliens? Oh, yeah, that could have happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's not wrong. He's wrong about the fifth one. God could have created it, and I believe he did, right? Mm -hmm. But he's not lying about the second one. Yeah. yeah, It's possible. It comes down to what you believe. And did Joseph Smith get a revelation from an angel or from God? It's possible. I wasn't there. Do I believe it? No, I don't believe it. I'm not a Mormon. But if somebody had a personal experience and that causes them to believe, I can respect that. Yeah, I so. think so too. I think, and I and I do think it's really important that you know <clears throat> when we because I, I'm not afraid. See, my eyes are wide open here, man. Like, like I I I don't get offended because I deconstructed my faith. I didn't believe in God for a very long time. I deconstructed my scriptures. You know, I mean, like, like I'm like, no, none of that affects my faith. I mean, you're hmm. you're studying these things too, and and that and you know, and I do have to say that spiritual things have happened to me too, and that to me, in one sense is more proves proves to me god than 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 scripture that that, hmm. that that's a supplement to the spiritual experiences i've had with the divine mm -hmm. and and that 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 these scriptures inform my faith mm -hmm. but they also are i think in one sense they they are man made right uh they are there's nobody disputes that men wrote these things down, right? Well, they definitely copied them, that's for sure. Yeah. And so so we 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 recognize that there's limitations to the written word, but but also the beauty of them too, that we literally do have this ancient document, this people from mm -hmm. a long period of time. We're hearing their voices from the dust, if you will. And we're able to hear yeah. these beautiful stories that of real history, real people. And it's 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 warts and all. And even Peter, he looks like a real jerk when he denies christ and everything like that he's a coward 
you know, this, these are not the stories of these uh, this mythology. It seems to be stories that are grounded in reality in one sense, which to me, it speaks to me in that way, because then I have that that connection to the people. These are real people that existed that wrote things down. OK, mm -hmm. I also believe that there was this roving prophet that Bart Ehrman believes in this ro roving prophet that was predicting the destru imminent destruction of the temple. And he was this preacher. And, and that and that and that and that that's a data point that I think most people would agree, including Bart Ehrman. I just I just believe that he was the son of God. Well, there are some people who would say that the, the parts of the New Testament where Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple were written after the temple was destroyed. But to me, that is exactly like Jeremiah is saying it's going to be after 70 years. The reason people believe in Jesus is he got that right. He got that right. The prophets who said the temple will never be destroyed, we don't even remember their names because the yes. temple was destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. And so to me, I think I just look at that, you know, that's where faith comes in. I do believe that Jesus has uh, made me into a new creature. He's transformed mm -hmm. my life. Um, he's made mm -hmm. me a better human being. And I look mm -hmm. forward to uh, spending eternity um in heaven what about you do you believe in heaven and hell so no um i do believe in um uh that when every well this is in ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 1 to 10 that everybody i'll give you the really short answer yeah. everybody dies they go to sheol which is the realm of the dead you're essentially in what christians call soul sleep right there's no consciousness or knowledge or action in sheol where you are going and everybody goes to sheol the good and the bad but then according to daniel 12 2 and um, the way I interpret at least Isaiah 26, 19 and Isaiah 66, there'll be a resurrection. And that is what it describes in some places in the Hebrew Bible as eternal life. And so, so I, I believe that what Christians would call heaven is something that's going to happen here on earth, that there'll be an, a, res, a, res, a new heaven and a new earth, okay. and people will be resurrected in that new heaven and new earth. It's not going to be in some other realm. God lives in heaven. I'm never going to be in heaven. Uh, unless I become an astronaut. That, that's my perspective, but I respect people who, and there are Jews who, it's interesting, Judaism does not have a single belief about the afterlife with the exception of resurrection. So there's something called the 13 principles of faith of Maimonides, which I don't ascribe all to because one of them is the oral law, and I don't believe in that one. But um, most Jews would say, okay, historically, that's what Judaism espoused um, with some you know, questions around the ed edges. Heaven and hell is not mentioned in the 13 principles of faith. Resurrection is, reward and punishment are, but not heaven and hell. Okay, interesting. So your eschatology yeah. kind of is uh, closer to Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses in one sense. Within, I, don't I, you think? I don't know what Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses believe. But it's very well, Seventh-day Adventists believe in soul sleep. And, okay. uh, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe that basically nobody, except for the 144,000, but essentially paradise is here on earth. So, so it it seems uh -huh. like uh, Judaism kind of uh, has your view, kind of matches there a, a little closer. I, I don't, I don't think my sure. view is is different than let's say mainstream Judaism. Where it might be different, as I said, that other than resurrection, there's all kinds of things Jews believe. There are Jews who believe in heaven and hell, but no Jew believes in eternal hell. In the Talmud, it says hell uh, suffering only lasts for eleven. I want, I want to say it's eleven months, um, which means essentially hell or Gehinom, Gehenna, in, in the Jews who do believe in it, it's analogous to Christian purgatory or Catholic purgatory. Okay. Um, and then there are Jews who believe in reincarnation, particularly Kabbalists um, and some Hasidim okay. believe in it. I don't believe in that. Right. But there, within Judaism, uh, there is no thing, oh, here's what you have to believe in the afterlife. Um, and look, Reformed Jews, which are the largest denomination in Judaism, they don't believe in an afterlife at all. Okay. Uh, so, so I have so, a question. My messianic neighbor sent me this text the other day. So I'm going to ask it because yeah. it's so appropriate. It's actually appropriate because our very first conversation was you driving away from this spot. It says, can you ask Nehemiah, or say your oh. name again. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Can you oh, ask yeah, we Nehemiah, spoke when I was in the car. Okay. Hey, where does the spirit go after death? Some say it, uh -huh. it travels through the cave at Kamakpala in Hebron on its way to its final destination. And also who's buried there? <laughs> So according to um, the book of Genesis, chapter 49, there are six people boarding, boarding, uh, buried in the cave of Machpelah, uh, the cave, it's, some kind of, it's called the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron. Uh, there's uh, Abraham, uh, his wife, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah, uh, Jacob, and Leah, 
Um, there's a Jewish tradition that says that Adam and Eve were buried there. That's not anywhere in the Bible, but that's a Jewish tradition. And there's a Jewish tradition that the head of Esau is buried there, and they can actually show you the spot where the head of Esau is buried. I don't believe he's buried there, but it's possible. Um, uh, what we can say with certainty about, or with confidence at least, because I can't say anything with certainty, what we can say with confidence about the cave of Machpelah, or the tomb of the patriarchs, is that um, uh, Herod built a monument or a building over the tomb of the patriarchs, which is still there today, and you can go and visit it. So at the very least, you, you can say that in the time of Herod, they believe that that's where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives were buried. Whether that's the case or not, well, that comes down to what you believe, right? But certainly 2,000 years ago, they believe that. And, and I want to make this point. You know, uh, look, I'm, I'm a Jew and I'm an Israeli citizen in addition to being an American citizen, and I'm unapologetically a Zionist. I believe, and by Zionist, I mean that God, I believe that God gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel. Okay. But even if you're an atheist who doesn't believe that, you know, there's this scene that actually happened because I saw it live on television where um, Netanyahu, who is the prime minister, not he's a prime minister now, but he was in the past as well. He, he uh, brought um, uh, Barack Obama to the Israel Museum, to the Shrine of the Book. And Obama was arguing, you know, you Jews, what's your, really your claim to Israel, the Holocaust? So uh, Netanyahu and, took him to the Shrine of the Book. He walked up to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he started reading from it. And he said, you see, Mr. President, this is what's reported. I didn't hear those words, but I saw him read from it. He says, you see, Mr. President, it's the same people speaking the same language. These scrolls weren't written in Arabic 2,200 years ago, which is when the Isaiah scroll was written, approximately. This was written in Hebrew. So even if you believe that there is no God and the Jews are just conquerors who conquered this from the Canaanites, okay, the minimalist position is that was 2,400 years ago. Right, the maximalist position is it was, which means in the time of Joshua, right, is that it was 3,400 years ago. What's a thousand years between you and me, right? How long have the Turks been in Asia Minor? Not even near that. Okay. How long have, um, and I don't know, name some people, how long have they been in that particular land? Very few people have been in a land for thousands of years. In some cases, they have, right? There was a case where they, they did a DNA test on this guy in England. Yeah. And they found he had the same DNA as somebody from like the Neolithic period or something. Yeah, like from one of the bog people or whatever. Yeah, found in the bog. Right. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, right. From, th from thousands of years. So it does happen, right? Yeah. Um, and then it was in and, the same village. Like, like right, it's, it's incredible. Right. Yeah. And, and somebody might look at my blonde hair, which I used to have, and blue eyes and say, oh, no, you didn't come from the Middle East. Okay, well. First of all, who says that they didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes in the ancient Middle East, number one. And number two, okay, I'm not saying that some of my ancestors weren't Cossacks that raped my ancestors, right? That happens, right? There were, um, wrote, whatever, we won't go into details, but look it up in history, right? There's a reason that Jews say that descent today, that descent is through the mother, because so many women were raped by um, Cossacks and pagans in different situations, right? Okay. So I've got some Cossack blood in me, but I'm not going to make any claim to Ukraine. My ancestors came from the land of Israel, whether it was 3,400 years ago or 2,400 years ago, that we can disagree on. Um, we can agree to disagree, right? If you think that King David is like King Arthur and, and they didn't exist, well, then you say it was in the time of Ezra. Fine. Okay. And if you believe it was earlier, then it was maybe a thousand years before that. But we've been in this land and we went into exile and for 2,000 years we prayed next year in Jerusalem. We never prayed next year in Ukraine, next year in, in you know, Germany, next year in Lithuania. We were prisoners in those lands, taken as exiles. We weren't allowed to leave. And when my great-grandfather, who I'm named after, Nehemiah Robinson, wanted to move to Israel, he didn't have the financial or political ability to come to the land of Israel. This was why he fled from Eastern Europe and went to Chicago. Um, but always he said the goal is eventually to return to the land of Israel. Mm. So, yeah. And, and, and whether you take the, the, um, the secular view that were invaders from 2,400 years ago or, or the, the faith view that is from 3,400 years ago, either way we're invaders, fair enough. Um, okay. 
I, I heard this speech from, um, I think it was Louis Farrakhan. He says, you Jews, your problem is you say your God gave us, you, you say that God gave you that land and you stole it from another people. Well, I mean, we didn't steal it from the Arabs. We stole it from the Canaanites, fair and square, just like everybody else. Just like the Turks stole it from the Greeks. Yeah. Um, and whether God exists or not, this has been our land for over 2,000 years. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. And and it is yeah. a remarkable story, the Jewish, uh, the, the the saga of the Jewish people, which I greatly mm -hmm. admire and respect. And I greatly admire and respect you, my friend. I think that we've had a really fascinating, almost three hour long conversation today. Yeah. I oh, feel wow. like it's just the beginning because yeah, I think there's so much to unpack. Was the goal. Well, we, but this is what I love. This is yeah. this is what I love about these open end conversations. I kind of did the same yeah. approach with Dan Vogel in my first interview. Uh, let's just turn the microphone on and let's just start talking, which is what okay. this conversation yeah. was today. Because I think that this is kind of fun. But I think well, there's a couple ideas that I've thrown at you. Like for instance, one of the things mm -hmm. I want to do is have Jewish converts to mm -hmm. the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day yeah. Saints or to Restoration churches uh, that believe mm -hmm. in the Book of Mormon. I want to have you being part of that conversation because you had. Said, I would love to do that. That sounds fascinating to me. So we can have that conversation. I also think that, you know, I do feel like, you know, one of the things I want to do is it's fascinating to me because you're, you are a scholar and there's this narrative within the Mormon community at large that largely mm. accepts the uh, Bart or like, like if you watch Mormon stories, you would think that Bart Ehrman and Dan McClellan are the uh, top biblical scholars in the world and that they represent mainstream biblical scholarship. Well, my goal is to have some of the top biblical scholars that are just as qualified as they are that take a different view, because I do think that that the people and also a lot of these people who have uh, even TBMs or True Blue Mormons accept some of this stuff because it kind of weakens the Bible, which because within Mormonism, there is a sense that because plain and precious things are taken from the Bible. And it's also there's this caveat where, well, we believe in the Bible as far as it's translated correctly, which kind mm -hmm. of puts a poison pill in the Bible within the context of the restoration. So I want us mm -hmm. to have conversations about how um, reliable the scriptures can be. I also kind of want to reconstruct the deconstruction mm -hmm. that I've had with my scriptures by having these conversations mm -hmm. with these uh, scholars such as you and other biblical scholars. I want to thank you so much for taking the time and talk to me because there's a lot to chew on the audience. I think there's a lot here to talk about. And I, I just want to thank you. Honestly, I want to thank you for blessing me, my brother. You blessed me today. Well, thank you for this conversation. It's been a real blessing to me. And I just uh, want to I want to wish yeah. you a happy uh, New Year. Well, it's not really the New Year that you don't think, though, right? No. Well, you, you could wish me Chag Sameach, which is happy feast. Okay. So, I love that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're uh, as we would say in Texas, where I live now, we're all right now in Jerusalem. We're, uh, we're fixing to have the Feast of Sukkot or Chag Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Awesome. Well, hey, it's one of my favorite hey. holidays. So I love this is a great time of year. As a matter of fact, here at my Christian community in Bradenton, Florida, we are celebrating yeah. the Feast of Tabernacles here. Oh, wow. Uh, we've been doing it since the 1980s. And so we have a yeah. deep connection to many people in this community spend time in Israel, live in Israel, and have deep connections. We have mm -hmm. Jewish converts to Christianity that live here as well. Yeah. It's a fascinating conversation. And many of them love you, by the way. They know about okay. you here at my Christian community. Oh, and we're Shalom, y'all. <laughs> and we we do appreciate you and yeah. sir I, I just an, an audience i just want to uh g give me your comments uh, i know you probably have a million questions you're probably like well you were talking about this and then you changed subjects well that's just going to happen when two people who like to talk get together. Give, us, give us topics to talk about we'll have topics to talk about we have i'm sure we'll have plenty of questions from the audience observations yeah. that people would mm -hmm. want to make and uh also i'm going to have links in the description to your uh, do you uh, like have a website and also youtube page? Yeah, my website is uh nehemiahswall.com or nehemiahswall.com uh, the way I remember that is in the Bible. Nehemiah built the wall, and uh, I was once ex I was once talking to this guy, and he said, "What's your name?" And I told him, and he said, "What kind of name is that?" I said, "Well, it's the guy in the Bible who built the wall around Jerusalem." Well, I saw him a few weeks later, and he says to his friend, "Hey, that guy is named after the man who built the wall around Jerusalem, like in the movie World War Z." And there's this scene in the movie, I think it's with Brad Pitt, where yeah. he built the wall, and, and it's an actual wall you can see. Um, although it's not like in the movie and it's and it's attacked by zombies it's actually to keep terrorists out but anyway uh, and a lot of things it's just a fence not a wall but whatever oh well, that's great i love it probably I love better it. in the movie <laughs> So Different yeah, there's wall. so much we can talk about because like Christianity <laughs> believes there was a zombie apocalypse that happened during the re resurrection. I mean, there's so many things that we can talk about, right? You know, it's it's crazy to think about, you know, right? I mean, 
That, that you know, that's what we. Believe. I don't know that it's fair to call that a zombie apocalypse. So we could talk about that in a well, different time. Well, that's using 21st century language to describe something from the first. That, century. That sounds like a Richard Carrier description of the uh, events. And, and I, I don't believe Richard Carrier. I've had him on my podcast. He, Hebrew voices, but you know that that is. Um, look, I mean, we can talk about that at a different time. But yeah, yeah we I don't have to think talk about that because there's so many. So much to unpack there, and I'm just joking, of course. We do believe in the resurrection, mm -hmm. but there's a there are some interesting stories that are being told. Are, should they yeah. all be taken literal? Are they supposed to be metaphorical? We don't know all the time, but this is where we have yeah. these wonderful conversations. Hey, I want to thank you. Can, can I end with this story about Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles? Let's do it, please. Do. This is going to be broadcast before before the end of Sukkot. I'm going to have this on Friday the 29th. I'm posting this Friday, 6 p.m. Oh, so it's perfect. Just when the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot begins. So my dad... My father, who was a lawyer, but was also a rabbi in Chicago. Uh, we lived in this 17-story building. Uh, actually, it was 16 stories because there was no 13th floor. Um, in uh, the north side of Chicago. And most of the building was Jewish, but they weren't religious Jews. And they, they were, you know, many, most were not observant Jews. And he was an Orthodox observant Jew. And he wanted us to have a sukkah which is a tabernacle. It's like an actual booth that you go and you have your meals in and some people sleep in it. Um, I used to sleep in it when I was younger all the time. Um, and he asked permission from the building management and they say, absolutely not. So my dad, uh, being a lawyer, he uh, asked them, he says, you know, I noticed a lot of people are parking their boats in, the, um, in their parking lot spaces out in the back of the building. Is it okay if I park a U-Haul trailer? A flatbed U-Haul trailer. Oh, absolutely. He says, can I get that in writing? So he gets it in writing, and he pulls into the parking lot with a U-Haul trailer with a sukkah built on the back of the trailer. And um, he gets this from the Talmud where it talks about if you're traveling in a caravan, you can build a sukkah on, on the back of a camel. And so he builds it on the back of a trailer. And this actually made it into the National uh, Jewish Newspaper in the United States back in the 70s and what's really crazy is i remember us going downstairs and eating our meals in the freezing cold of chicago in that trailer in that in, in the sukkah built in the back of a trailer so that is, anyway that's my my, my sukkot story that's awesome oh, and by the way just you know we, we both same background you know not backgrounds but similar uh uh area that we yeah. grew up in of course you're watching doctor who on wttw channel 11 saturday nights right is that what you were watching your doctor absolutely <laughs> and actually i uh on our uh uh i want to say it was a vhs but it was betamax um i used to record them on the betamax and i was obsessed i would watch them over and over and over um it was, it was, I love Doctor Who. I could have told you the plot to every episode and the ones that were lost even back in the 80s. Um, I knew what the basic storyline was. I'd read the novels where they novelized uh, right. many of them. And um, yeah, no, I was, I was, it's interesting. I do today with uh, manuscripts, what I used to do with Doctor Who, I would go and I would hunt down the sources as much as I could or reconstruct the lost ones. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> That's great. Well, I love you, brother. You are so awesome, folks. Tell us what you think. Just a reminder, uh, go to mormonbookreviews.com to our merch store so you can purchase hats, coffee mugs, uh, or excuse me, hot chocolate mugs. Uh, and then also, uh, for those of you who like to financially support us, we have links to Patreon, PayPal, as well as Venmo. And uh, just remember, the most important thing is this, folks. Remember, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.